are recorded. So uh, the, the recordings can't be edited and they'll be posted. So assume, you know, pretend that you're on live TV. Uh, keep it, you know, try to be quiet, you know, when you're talking amongst yourselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, be civil. All right. So thank you. Um, just some logistics uh, for participants on the Google uh, on the Google Meet. Uh, everybody's muted by default, so we ask you to use the chat function. Uh, we'll be monitoring uh, the chat uh, offline. Well, uh, we'll, we'll uh, Wei and I will be monitoring the chat, so we'll we'll ask your questions uh, for you. Uh, please, uh, presenters, uh, try to send your presentations to Elizabeth Faircloth uh, so that, you know, we can just have them on this laptop and, and uh, zip right through them. Uh, for people who are here, uh, lunch is on your own. Uh, we will have coffee breaks with snacks occasionally. The, the break in an hour is just a bio break. The break after that will be uh, coffee, et cetera. Uh, we're uh, trying to organize an informal uh, dinner tomorrow at Under the Sun, which is a restaurant down the hill. Um, uh, we'll have a sign-up sheet uh, link to the website, to the meeting website soon. And uh, uh, you people who are taking the shuttle uh, can get to the shuttle, uh, to the shuttle schedule uh, at this uh, also from the meeting website. Okay. Well, I think that's it for logistics. So I'm going to give a quick, uh, a quick update on CAM. Um, here's the outline. Uh, I'm going to introduce our new co-chair in a, in a second. I'm going to spend most of the time really just kind of taking stock of where we are in CAM 7 development. and. Uh, I'll be talking uh, about our uh, new vertical resolution simulation. I think we now have enough experience that it's you know it's a good time to stop and see uh, see where we are. I'll touch on our plans for future development. I'll you know throw up a slide uh, on bar res, which will be covered more extensively uh, tomorrow, and uh, we'll uh, also mention some other topics uh, in development and planning for, for CESM, I mean for CAM. All right, uh, so first, uh, co-chair rotation. Uh, Christiana Yablonowski has rotated off after eight years. Um, so uh, uh, she made, you know, as, as all of you have been a me uh, members of this group for a while, she, she made uh, substantial contributions, uh, including the uh, vertical resolution and uh, spectral element uh, development that will be, you know, you'll see it in, in the slides I'm showing uh, next. Uh, so we're very excited to have Wei Wan join us from PNNL. She's sitting here. I'm really looking forward to working. Uh, Kevin and I are both uh, looking forward to working with Wei in the future. Uh, and uh, I think she'll have a lot to contribute in the next, in, in our next phase of development. Okay then, uh, so uh, I want to uh, describe, you know, uh, where we are uh, with CAM7. Um, so here, you know, here are, uh, at the top of this slide, are our goals for CAM7. You know, our, our, our main goal, uh, is to produce a single workhorse model for the atmosphere with a top at around 80 kilometers. Uh, we settled on a resolution that results in 93 levels. Uh, the idea here is to have a better resolved stratosphere. Uh, this model, it's the workhorse. It will obviously run with full chemistry as an option. We, of course, can uh, run with simpler chemistry if we want. Uh, we also uh, wanted to develop a somewhat cheaper version uh, for, you know, kind of quicker, uh, more economical uh, tropospheric uh, physics development. That is 
uh, a model uh, with a top at around 40 kilometers. It has 58 layers, and the layers below, well, somewhere below around 10 millibars, the vertical grids uh, in the L93 and L58 are identical. Uh, both have significantly increased PBL resolutions over what we've had in the model before. Uh, our, our diff and, and also in the, in the free troposphere, just a, a number, uh, the CAM6 vertical grid spacing in the free troposphere is 1,200 meters. It's now around 500 meters. So where we are now, um, we're, I, I, you know, at, when you're in development, there's no clear way of tagging these, these models. I'm going to call CAM 6 Plus uh, the suite of things we have now that we've been using for about a year. Um, we, uh, we, started, uh, init we started a coupled evaluation in the spring, and uh, we've uh, basically just finished that uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, rather. And, uh, you know, at the end here, uh, I want to talk about our, our future plans for CAM 6++. All right, so this is just a, a, a quick and dirty timeline. So up to sp uh, spring of, of last year, uh, we had sort of four streams of independent development, atmosphere, ocean, land, land ice, and sea ice. We're developing their components. We came together in spring and started doing some coupled, you know, some coupled development. Uh, as is always the case, you know, you don't just really stop and uh, just let things, you know, uh, d don't worry about anything. Uh, during this, you know, period of coupled evaluation and development, of course, we were tuning, uh, we were fixing bugs. Um, so now uh, we're going to enter another phase of more intensive component development. Uh, you know, uh, nominally that started in fall. It really hasn't, uh, you know, with AGU and et cetera. Uh, we expect this to really ramp up in, in, the, next, in the next few months. So uh, this is CAM 6 Plus. Um, most of it's familiar. Uh, really, the, uh, the things that have changed are uh, what we're calling ZM2 and physics reordering. And I've tried to briefly give you an idea of what those are. This is, this is our old vertical grid in the, you know, in, in the boundary layer, let's say. So you see the coarse spacing here, and this is our new grid, much, uh, much finer in the boundary layer. Uh, we had to modify the way ZM treated its uh, its launch levels and parcel properties. So it, it used to look for a H max, the you know uh, moist moist static energy maximum, and it would launch from there with properties. Well, it would launch from the surface with properties taken from H max. Now we average properties uh, over a fraction of the boundary layer height. Uh, physics reordering. Uh, the the main the main uh, the main change in the physics reordering is that club and radiation are now after uh, the surface coupling in the model. So that was done. Uh, this is uh, that was done uh, by Adam Harrington, who's in the room somewhere. Um, there, there he is. Uh, this was done primarily to alleviate um, uh, what we think are spurious oscillations. And well, they're two delta x, so. Whether they're spurious oscillations or not, they're not being well resolved. Uh, we, we wanted to uh, tamp those down, and we, uh, we, uh, we discovered that the coupling order, or sort of the order of club before surface coupling, was exacerbating that problem. OK, so now I'm just going to show, uh, you know, just go through some, go through some slides uh, that show uh, what this CAM6 Plus uh, L58, uh, I'll give an excuse for why I'm not showing L93 later. Uh, so uh, the first thing I want to point out is, you know, this, this was a very big bias 
uh, in CAM6, a sort of a big disappointing bias uh, that uh, CAM6's sea level pressure uh, was not as good as, as CAM, CAM, well, yes, as CAM5. Uh, what you see here is, you know, focus on the bottom plots and note that, you know, where, where the, the differences are opposite, it means things have improved in CAM6 plus uh, compared to CAM6. So in CAM6 over here, you know, we have a very deep, you know, uh, a not, you know uh, uh, erroneously deep low at high latitudes uh, in mean sea level pressure. And, you know, you can see there's a pretty close spatial correlation between the changes uh, going from L L32 to L58 CAM6+. Plus. We have eliminated a lot of the sea level pressure bias in the model uh, by uh, moving to L58 with reordered physics and ZM2. I'm not sure which of those changes uh, made the biggest difference, uh, but this is, this is where we are now. So one large bias in CAM6 has uh, been significantly reduced. Um, what is this? Oh, this is surface stress. You know, for surface stress, it's not as, not as happy a story. Um, it's hard to tell. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't have, uh, I didn't have sort of matching colors, et cetera, for our, our, our L32 control. You can see that there are, you know, there are places where we do have, you know, opposing, opposing differences. So here, south of Australia, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, I, sh I was supposed to remind you not to touch the screen. So, <laughs> so okay. Um, yeah, so south of Australia, things have improved, you know, kind of other places. You, you can find places where the colors here indicate opposite differences. There are some places where they don't. But, you know, there, there are some, some places where tau x, the, the, the wind stress, has, has improved over what it was in CAM6. Um, one thing I was surprised, and I'm su mostly surprised that we hadn't noticed this before, um, or I hadn't, um, there's, a, there's a nice change in, in shortwave, shortwave cloud forcing uh, between, the, between the two models. Um, you can see our, our stratus decks have gotten, so here they're very, you know, they're, they're, they're very deficient. So green here means the stratus decks are actually too thin. And that's been, you know, that's been, that bias has been reduced in, in the new model. So you see all the stratus decks have opposing, you know, opposing colors. So that's, that's another positive change. Where do I am? Two seconds. I better hurry up here. Um, Zonal mean temperature is generally improved. And then our real problem is, uh, and I'm sorry, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get, get more control over the L32 controller uh, soon. Um, but what I want to point out here is that water vapor bias that uh, we had in CAM6 is certainly not improved. It may be, it may be exacerbated in the new model. And that water vapor bias is especially toxic to stratospheric chemistry. So we, we, have, we have some work to do uh, with, with water vapor in the model. El Nino is the best ever. Well, I'm quoting, uh, quoting Rich. <laughs> not really quoting Rich, but the El Nino is not bad. Um, so and so in the 32 level, uh, sorry, in the 50, uh, 58 level model with, uh, with MOM6, the new ocean model, uh, looks pretty good. All right, so then just to summarize, you know, uh, you, you, can read, you can read the summary. I just want to point out one problem we do have and that we haven't really figured out how to solve. It's a problem we have every time we develop a new coupled model. The Labrador Sea just, just likes to freeze. It doesn't freeze in reality, but in our model, it likes to freeze. 
So our next steps are, you know, CAM6 plus, but with L93, and here's the excuse for why I haven't shown more of that. We've recently found a bug in the orographic drag, and we haven't, we haven't run enough of L93, at least uh, in time for this meeting, to really assess the, the climate of L93. L58 incorporates the fix to this bug. Now, uh, if the small time remaining, uh, here's what we're planning for the next stage. Um, so there's sort of a readiness scale at the bottom. Uh, things in dark blue are things, in my opinion, are ready to go in. And it's just a matter of you know, putting them in and tuning them. The things in lighter colors are, are, are contributions which I think are very important, but they may require more, more, more development. So we're going to put in Puma's microphysics in the next phase. Uh, you'll hear about aerosol development, I think, uh, from, from the CCWG. Uh, we're implementing a new, a new club code base, which has, importantly, has prognostic momentum fluxes and a new way of expressing the tunable parameters as time scales. Uh, Peter Lauritsen's working on a rigorous enthalpy flux uh, from the atmosphere. Um, Club EDMF is sort of a mass flux plume extension uh, for Club. And finally, uh, CLASP is a, and I should mention that the prognostic momentum flux, Club EDMF, and CLASP are all CPTs. Uh, there will be talks on these uh, on Wednesday on, on CLASP, Club EDMF, and uh, on prognostic momentum flux. And we'll have a session on automated tuning on Wednesday also in the morning. So, you know, hopefully, you know, we're hoping that some sort of automated tuning might help us uh, get through this, this development. So this is our very approximate timeline for CAM7. Um, the only, the only, it's not hard and fast either. Uh, I was told by Jean-Francois Lamarck before he left that we should expect an AR7 report to come out sometime in 2028. Working back from that, we'd need to have a model ready sometime in 2024 if it takes us as long to get the things that we need to get done ready for the report. So we're expecting that CAM 6++ will be uh, the atmospheric component of what we use for the next uh, IPCC. Uh, although I think, and I maybe shouldn't say this, but I think CAM 6 is a reasonable, reasonable fallback. And depending on status of the various CPT contributions, we may want to extend, you know, freezing CAM7 beyond this uh, AR, you know, AR-driven timeline. Okay, so quickly, um, there's going to be a session on high resolution and variable, uh, variable resolution modeling tomorrow in the morning at 9. Um, I'll just let you read the slide. Uh, other topics, oh, I forgot to mention this, which I really want to highlight. Uh, the other thing that we're planning on doing in the next few months to a year or more is to rework the infrastructure for physics, physics coupling in the model. This is the so-called CCPPization, which Jesse Nussbaumer sitting in the back will talk a little bit about uh, this, uh, later, later this session. Okay, so uh, other topics of general interest. It's a community physics package I just talked. Uh, uh, Justin Riffling will talk about uh, updated diagnostics. Uh, Monica Morrison will talk about climate justice. And uh, on Tuesday, uh, tomorrow in the high resolution section, uh, Dave Randall will give an update on Earthworks. So with that, I'll stop and... I don't think there are time, there's time for questions, unfortunately. I already went one minute past my allotted time. So uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, the next speaker is... We'll, ha we'll have a discussion session at, 
at the end of this at the end of this session before the break. Huh? Oh. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, could we get some? Uh, we're going to have to switch laptops. So yeah, if if people could uh, mail your talk to Elizabeth Faircloth, uh, she'll she'll load them up to the uh, to the website. Okay, never mind, we got it. I was looking at the wrong web. Oh, that's you. Okay. Anyone can help me <laughs> quickly. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. I never do this through the through Google. Okay. Cool. I'm gonna give the part of the working group update for a whole atmosphere, and then um, Nick Petitello's remote in, and we'll switch off at some point in the middle. Um, so my name is Nick Davis. Um, we've also had an external co-chair uh, rotation. So Dan Vizioni is our new external co-chair. Um, Jessica New stepped down after quite a few years of, of service. Um, so we've shared a timeline before of um, some of our like focused um, you know, community support, physics, and um, basically fundamental focus on development here. And I think just broad brush, you'll, you'll start to understand most of our focus the, the, the last year and the year going forward is on um, integrating with the workhorse model. So we're kind of like a delayed oscillator. Um, how did I do that? Okay. Whoever's online. Uh, Okay, that was wild, all right, <laughs> cool. Okay, <laughs> terrifying. Um, so thanks for advancing the slide, <laughs> that's perfect. Um, so just to talk about some of the physics developments that are important, and I think Simone's gonna mention some of these. There's an update to photolysis, which Doug is gonna talk about on Wednesday. Um, there's multiple talks on Karma, the new aerosol model, which has a lot of relevance to especially things like geoengineering applications. This has been, Julio has mentioned it, but there's some motion towards fixing the dry stratosphere problem. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, this is one of the many reasons we've sort of, um, okay, whoever's controlling this needs to stop. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry, this is really hard to deal with when that happens. Um, but I think this is another reason why we wanted to wait before waiting too much into the new version of Wacom. So some of the key development priorities we're working on, evaluating and tuning the new Wacom and Wacom X uh, vertical schemes using the SE die core, and I'll share a slide of at least the Wacom portion of that new grid, uh, basically in inheriting most of the cam, the cam grid most of the way through the stratosphere. Um, Extending m pass vertically, which means coupling to chemistry and carrying it up through the thermosphere, and then coupling Wacomex with Gamera um, to uh, do better space weather science. Um, then some key production tasks that we're focusing on, because I feel like we're both development and we do a lot of sort of applied use of the model here, looking at sudden stratospheric warming dynamics in this new version of the model, um, 
This is joint with CCWG, but doing a sort of evaluation of both flavors of the, the new version of CAM, WACM, whatever you want to call it, the L93 and L135 uh, versions of the model looking especially at climate and geoengineering applications, and then the impacts those have on the space environment. Okay, so um, previously we had proposed some ideas for how to approach a new vertical grid. We settled on roughly 135 level scheme. Um, the black dots here are our current 110 level scheme in the finite volume dynamical core. The red dots here are the 93 level CAM scheme and then the open circles is what we're currently working with with Wacom 6 plus <laughs> plus. Um, so you can see the key is that rather than following CAM workhorse through the stratosphere where we'd get worse vertical spacing in the middle and upper stratosphere, we're actually taking a more gentle taper through the stratosphere into the mesosphere and lower thermosphere. Um, so you can see basically at these lower altitudes, we're inheriting the same exact grid as, as the workhorse model. Um, the goal of that is to reduce some turn, tuning workload. Um, and you can see a quick summary of the core hours here. This is not a super cheap model when we're running at one degree nominal SE with full chemistry. But we chose to run with sort of, instead of carrying multiple level schemes, we decided to basically carry one level scheme and split into two degree simplified middle atmosphere chemistry, very cheap, probably good for a lot of middle atmosphere folks, and then a very sort of high cost, high resolution version of the model. Um, we're barely touching the surface with the 135 level version of the model, but I wanted to show results from the first run we did to give y'all an idea of, of where stuff stands transitioning to SE. Um, basically what we did is we took essentially the two degree, and this should be FV, uh, settings and carried them over to two degree SE and applied them to the, the 135 level version of the model. This is our 70 layer Wacom FV, and this is the difference between that SE run and FV. And I would ignore the, the tropics because there's some QBO tuning issues. But the key point is there is in this run the orographic gravity wave bug. So these differences here, this is DJF. This is the orographic gravity wave bug. This is all frontal wave stuff. And what's wild to me is um, we basically used the same settings and got a third of the gravity wave forcing in the SE die core uh, in the mesosphere. So basically the mesopause is way too low, way too warm. Um, so I think for now, we're just trying to even get a decent base state before we even touch QBO tuning. And I will say, there's some folks talking about the QBO in two degree Wacom FV on Wednesday. I think that's important because if we're gonna be carrying one degree and two degree Wacom, we want both to have a good QBO. So trying to work with them to make sure we carry over some of that knowledge to, to the SE version of the model. Um, this is something that um, I don't think we saw coming six months ago, but needed to happen. Um, uh, the Wacom Group participated in the Chemistry Climate Model Initiative 2022. So basically focused on um, things like the ozone assessment report and producing a lot of important MIP style runs. Um, we worked with some folks to try to seamerize output for this. And using the CMIP6 Seymour workflow, we could not uh, basically figure it out. Um, it was very labyrinthine. I think it's possibly a CMIP6 specific um, process, but um, we basically had to develop a, if you're wondering why some of our development is behind, it's because we actually needed to develop a stopgap way to seamerize our output for some of these MIPS we're doing right now. Um, but I think one discussion, maybe the group should have is how we approach these MIP type things in the future and whether there's a way to do this stuff online in the model so we don't have to break our backs dealing with model output after the fact. But um, that can be maybe a point of discussion later. But that's, I think that's, that's really important, I think, to reduce workload for us because it was very difficult even working with a data engineer and a software engineer to even try to figure out how to mishmash our CCMI stuff into the CMIP6 code and it just couldn't work. Okay, so I'm gonna step aside for Nick now.
And then this also had to do with regridding uh, between the physics mesh and then the irregular uh, grid that is used for the geomagnetic field uh, coordinates, which is part of, necessary for ionosphere and electrodynamics. Uh, so that was done as well. Uh, and we've successfully run this at both uh, coarser resolution, uh, one degree, uh, and then also a high resolution uh, configuration, which I'll show some of the results on on the next slide. Uh, so Nick, can you go to advance the slide, please? All right, thanks. So just a few words on the high resolution uh, simulation of WACAMEX. This is with uh, NE120 uh, and 273 levels. Uh, so it's roughly about a 25 kilometer horizontal resolution and a, a 0 0.1 scale height resolution in thermosphere. Uh, and this gives us a much better representation of the gravity wave forcing uh, because they're uh, resolved uh, self consistently within the model. And that you can see on the lower left slide side, which shows the zonal mean zonal wind in the contour. And then the color shading is the gravity wave forcing. And there's two main points here with this figure. First, uh, the representation of the zonal winds in the mesosphere and lower thermosphere are better reproduced when the gravity waves are simulated self-consistently versus with the parameterization. And then into the thermosphere, uh, you can see that there's fairly significant uh, gravity wave forcing, uh, which is usually not included in the, the low resolution simulation since we don't have an effective parameterization for the thermosphere gravity waves in the current versions of the model. Uh, and so by adding this initial additional forcing into the thermosphere due to the resolved waves, you get a, a different circulation in the thermosphere. And this has important implications as well for improving the thermosphere composition. Uh, and then the other feature that is important that we can capture in the uh, thermosphere and ionosphere is smaller scale gravity waves, which you can see on the, the bottom right uh, depiction of perturbations in the ionosphere uh, column density. And you can see a lot of these smaller scale structure that is consistent with what we see in a lot of the ground-based observations uh, from GPS uh, ground-based receivers. Uh, and to sort of show the, the power of this uh, high resolution simulation, if Nick, if you can go to the next slide, uh, hopefully the movie will work. So this is movie showing a uh, simulation of the Honga Tonga uh, eruption. The bottom panel is the uh, surface pressure perturbation. And then the top uh, panel is the total electron content uh, variation. And you can see first on the, the bottom uh, panel, you get this pressure pulse uh, traveling across the surface, which is consistent uh, with observations uh, of uh, surface pressure wave. And then on the top, you see the all these sort of small scale wave perturbations occurring in the ionosphere, uh, electron density coincident with the, the pressure perturbations on the surface. Uh, and I, I, we don't have time to show here, but the wave perturbations in the ionosphere are, are very consistent with what you see in the observations. So yeah, you can go to the next slide. And then one of the additional things we're working on with WACMX is uh, moving towards a whole geospace model, which would be a coupled model between the ionosphere or thermosphere model in WACMX and then the Gamera uh, magnetospheric model, which provides better representation of a high latitude forcing. Uh, and what's shown here is the thermosphere vertical winds. Uh, so the, roughly 350 kilometers or so. Uh, on the left is a latitude longitude plot of the vertical wind WACMX driven by Gamera at uh, high resolution. And then on the right is a lower resolution version. Uh, and when we run a higher resolution one, we get more sort of uh, dual heating or so the heating going into high latitudes by resolving smaller scale features. And you can see also on the, the left hand plot, there's a lot more smaller structure in the, the wave perturbations uh, that we see at high latitude. So this is a one-way coupled simulation with the magnetosphere driving 
the ionosphere, and we're currently working on a two-way couple version so that then the, the processes occurring in the ionosphere can then feed back onto the magnetosphere uh, as well. Uh, so next slide. So just as a, a summary, you know, we're uh, kind of continuing our, our work on middle upper atmosphere research uh, in both Wacom and Wacom X, uh, and trying to you know balance between lower cost type of simulation, but then also these very uh, high resolution and higher cost configuration. And of course, we only gave a quick summary of what is you know going on. There's a lot of other things. Um, uh, such as improved gravity wave parameterization to address some of these model biases, uh, and then also extending uh, MPAS into the thermosphere, which you'll hear about more uh, later in the session, and then also some uh, specified dynamics uh, improvements for higher resolution uh, Wacom and Wacom X. And so we'll conclude our presentation there, and we can, I guess, take question now or uh, at the end of the, the session during the discussion time. Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. Okay, good. So again, yeah, I uh, just acknowledge uh, our co-chair, co-chair, uh, outside co-chair Rafa Fernandez, um, our liaison Rebecca Buchholz, and uh, a lot of thanks to also our software engineer Francis Witt and other software engineers working uh, with us here. And uh, I'm also not going to show actually any model results. Um, we are really working towards the Chem 7 or the Chem 6 Plus workhorse model. Uh, with chemistry, uh, so ChemCam will be the full chemistry workhorse model uh, coming up uh, in the future. And so uh, we're really trying to get uh, prepared for this and, and integrate uh, with on top of all the developments that Julio has mentioned. So here on the right, we have the workhorse model going to 80 kilometers, 93 levels, and then there's the LOTO version as well. A lot of our development is still happening in the 32 level model. That's our default model. We may still discuss to keep it in some ways because of uh, being cheap, but that's a different discussion. I want to give an overview. So uh, what we are working on or have already implemented in the new development version is listed here, especially for the chemistry part. We're updating, as usual, our um, you know chemical reactions to latest rates and uh, details will be discussed tomorrow or in this issue of GitHub. Uh, then there is a new aerosol scheme, and uh, Julio promised that I talk about a little bit, but uh, so now for all chemistry versions, we are gonna use the MAM5 version Everybody knows that the CAM version is a MAM 4.4 modes. Now we add a stratospheric sulfate mode, and those models that have chemistry will have that extra mode. However, if you run without chemistry, you still have a MAM 4 version. You don't need that mode. But what we will change is the actually distribution of the coarse mode, the largest uh, mode width, and if we go back to the CHEM 5 uh, version, which is something that we think is more reasonable to represent dust and sea salt. Other things is that we do have now online DMS, DMS emissions, all model versions that will come in. And um, we will work on that the COMTES automatically uses, this is a um, online uh, ARC interface for sortable species or oasis that is based on machine learning. 
And uh, we have other developments for the low top model to inc include lower bo uh, upper boundary conditions now that have not been included previously. We heard about the water vapor fix that we need to include and is still in development. And then specifically for chem without chemistry, uh, we will hear a talk later today on a new SOA, simple chemistry parametrization. And the reason is we wanna really have a model for with and without chemistry that radiatively performs very similarly, because in the past we had to retune always uh, when we had a no chemistry and a chemistry version. And we hope that we're coming closer to this, uh, that, that radiation, radiation is more similar. And so, uh, yeah, we hear about this later. The new version of CHEM with 93 or 58 levels also has more interactive greenhouse gases um, that are still lower boundary fixed conditions, but they uh, are uh, having loss terms in the uh, atmosphere. And uh, what we're gonna do is again, we use CHEM CHEM to uh, derive fields for oxidants and aerosols that will be prescribed in the CHEM version. And so as soon as we have all the developments uh, in the next few months or in the next month uh, on the development code, we'll really starting to testing all these different changes that are coming up. And then there are more developments that are happening and we will hear about uh, in the, today and in the next days. Uh, one is the uh, HEM co-emission component by Hai Peng Lin. And, and that's a really useful thing because emissions will always have to be regridded. If you run with chemistry or not, if you run a different model grid. And this um, tool, the HEMCO will be online and able to regrid your emissions. So we don't have to do this uh, beforehand, uh, which, which always can in, in, uh, introduce uh, mistakes and other things. So that's something coming up. We're working on a new photolysis scheme. Dick had already mentioned it, and if you're interested, this is really important for chemistry, and we will have a joint uh, chemistry webcam session on Wednesday morning, and Doug Anderson will talk about this. Other things we have discussed that will come in with time, so we're expecting uh, to test this all by the summer. One thing is also very short-lived halogen chemistry that will be discussed more in the chem, -chem session tomorrow. And then we do have uh, additional developments that are more in parallel, but they may or may not go in in the new CHEM 7 version, depending on where we are with the developments. But there is a bit of work on section and aerosol and cloud modeling now. And there will be two talks, one by myself as well, on Tuesday afternoon in the joint session. There are other developments uh, with the GeoSCHEM model to integrate that into CESM. We heard about it last, week, last year, so if you're interested, you can look back at developments there. And then there's a lot of software engineering updates as part of SEMA, of the more integrated modeling framework that you heard about. There is also a lot of work about Musica, and you'll learn about this a little bit later, also from Luisa Emmons in her talk. We, we do really, um, want to get a model framework that is more independent that you can model or, or it's like the CCPT framework that we are talking about. And part of those developments will be a model independent chemistry module. And as I said, Louisa Emmons will talk about this uh, later this afternoon. And then abstract aerosol interface, I will give a couple uh, slides on that. Uh, we all already heard about MPAS, and we're also trying to do an MPAS chem chem version. Francis, Witt, and Mary both are working on it, and we already talked about uh, TOV earlier. And we are having evaluation packages. There will be a talk on the AMWG evaluation uh, package, but there's also things going on for chemistry, and uh, we hear more about this uh, during this working group meeting. Just a little bit on the abstract aerosol interface, and this will be part of the system for integrated modeling of the atmosphere. So the goal, if you ever looked at the uh, model code, you can see that aerosols are entwined all over in the code, and you have a lot of if statements, if it's MAM3, MAM4, or MAM7, it's really complicated to add a new aerosol module. And this attempt is really to identify and separate different, the aerosols from the main aerosol, from the chem, chem uh, components, like they are all listed here. This is all the components where aerosols interact with. So what we wanna do is we wanna uh, take the interactions in the main model, but make it model, uh, aerosol model independent and, and try to find an easy way. So the timeline is really to first start with MEM, and we already have accomplished that for the cloud aerosol um, 
uh, model codes. And, and now we're working our way through uh, the different routines, as you can see here. And once this is done, we can add other aerosol models like Karma to this in a much more easier way. So maybe just a little bit to make it a little bit more understandable, what we are doing is we're basically this abstract aerosol interface contains an abstract aerosol property class that is like, what are the properties in my configuration? Um, for example, the number of modes, the bins, the number of species, something you fix, you have fixed in the initial conditions. But all the aerosol files or models you want to integrate, you have to identify what those are. And then you have the aerosol states, the aerosol state class that is the varying things like mixing ratios, cloud concentration, number concentrations, things like that. So that there are places where this is all taken care of, but the host model, TAM, doesn't need to know what aerosol model that is. So we'll hopefully hear more about this in summer. And um, I do not want to really talk about Musica much here. I just say many people wonder what, what is Musica. And it's, it's kind of, for me, when you think of uh, CESM, the chem, chem and work and the aerosol and chemistry part, the model related part that is a framework that we want to make more uh, flexible. And in that regard, we are really already working a lot on different regional refined regions. So unfortunately, uh, the session on Tuesday morning when we have the chem, chem session is focusing on this topic and chem, chem Musica is really, uh, so we are really interested in this part and in the exchange of the different regions. We do have a Musica website. We created various variable grids and collect them here. And I hope we can all work together to expand this data set and help the users to use this. I don't know how much time there is. I don't want to go too much over. So just a few uh, highlights. Uh, I already said one of the, um, oh, I haven't said that. So so last time uh, we mentioned that our field campaign, the Eclipse field mission will come up. And that actually uses this regional refined model grid here over Asia. And it was very useful as a forecast model. We were able to actually predict and use it as forecast tool besides other models to identify the Asian monsoon outflow. This was part of this campaign to really understand transport pathways to the UTLS chemical tr uh, content and aerosol sites and composition. And some of the work, uh, and, and uh, we will have some talks uh, on this on Wednesday, but data are not yet uh, available, so there's not too much yet, but more is coming. And finally, as I said, we are, uh, especially Francis Witt and Mary Voss are developing the ChemCast MPAS, uh, the ChemCam MPAS version, and uh, they uh, developed a version over the Asian summer monsoon, which is uh, progressing in the development. We already, I mean, Francis already was able to run at least a day and uh, working with initial conditions. There's a lot of work going on to really interpolate the emissions, hopefully using the HEMCO um, emissions uh, tool for this and other things that still have to be implemented, but uh, this is also on the way. And with that, I will stop. And I think we'll start the discussion now. I kept it a little, maybe not quite as long as I had, but so I, we have more time for discussion. Thank you. So I don't know if we have a discussion slide. Is it you to lead the discussion? Okay, well, we can all come up maybe. Nick. Yeah, yes. question to the talks, I guess, too. And we can hand around our mics. And my, my understanding is that we don't need, uh, we don't need a mic oh. because the, the microphones and the ceiling are so sensitive that... Yeah. yeah, I was just confused about the status of the stratospheric water vapor problem. Is it still, it's still there, <laughs> but you know how to fix it? And how did you fix it? Could somebody explain to me where, what that is? Somebody in the audience? Adam? Or will there be someone who's got good club knowledge can explain this better than I can? Um, yeah, so all else things being fixed. Microphone? No, I, I don't think we need a microphone. No? Do we need a microphone? No, I think that we got no, a big brother here. Yeah. 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 Um, all else things fixed when you go from L32 to L58. We have found that the dynamics 
tend to dry out the stratosphere. And so um, it's a very difficult thing to resolve because basically we have more accurate vertical transport at L58. And the consequence of that is we have more gravity waves that dry out the stratosphere. So <clears throat> it is what the model does when you increase vertical resolution. We have, we have found um, the, the, we have a small marginal fix that might help, that, that seems to moisten closer to the tropopause, um, less within the stratosphere. And what we do is, in the, in the past, when we let club be active in the stratosphere, it was, there were some limiters that were causing unrealistic drying. And so many years ago, we put in a fix that basically said, uh, we're going to correct that. So we took all the tendencies out of the stratosphere and we dump them into the troposphere. That's how things have been operating in CAM 6. And so instead, what we did, Ben and I, is we went into club and we fixed that problem with the spurious drying tendencies in the stratosphere. And now we let club operate at whatever vertical level it wants. So in the past, yes, club was causing drying tendencies, but we fixed that by taking everything out of all the club tendencies in the stratosphere and dumping them into the troposphere. So we fixed the original problem of club drying out the stratosphere, but in the past that we had a fix for that that was really wonky and it wasn't impacting the stratosphere. I didn't know it's confusing, but that's that's what happened. And so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> Stay. We made things more physical, but um, the marginal well, impact the on the moisture. Do we have a fix? No. Okay, I'm going to pass because I'm pretty confused. I'm in charge. Okay. Um, I'd also say that, at least in the atmosphere working group, our motivation to spend a whole lot of time fixing this bias now, when we're just about to introduce three new physics parameterizations that are going to have an effect on water vapor, is small. If, you know, if, if after a year of trying to, you know, maybe not a year, but if after a year of, you know, implementing the new club external with Momentum, fluxes, prognostic, kumas. If we still have a problem, then we'll 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 do what, well. We'll do what we can. I'll also answer that and say we hung back a bit on getting spun up at this one thirty-five to see what happened, and I think just knowing the club part was fixed, the spurious side was fixed, that was sort of like, even if water vapor is not perfect, now I feel more com now I feel more comfortable dipping toes in, because now we're dealing with maybe more physical changes in the troposphere property, and that's fine. I just, you know, spurious issues are fixed, but I think there's going to be a back and forth for the next year while stuff's added. And, yeah. One, one, I have a it's question. on our mind. I had a question for Adam, and uh, have you guys looked at, you know, a few months ago we were looking at the stratospheric water vapor bias in a very targeted way. Have we done that since the, the fixes that you and Ben put in have become like the default club? Um, I, I, the impact of the fixes, I have, I have done those experiments and, mm -hmm. and, and you do see some marginal moistening of, of the trope pause a little above and a little below. So I think you should see that slight improvement. Just check it, checking the chip that there is nothing at the moment. There's, there's, there's a, a raise here. Oh, okay. I don't know if you, we wanted to read the question or if he can uh, unmute himself. Leo, do you want to unmute you? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Yeah, just a quick question, Julio, and apologies if I missed this. For the CMIP uh, L93 workhorse, what horizontal resolution are you thinking about? Good point. I didn't mention it, but uh, one degree. We're, 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Here's some more from Christian. So Christiana says the stratospheric water vapor in ES, E3SM V2 is also extremely dry. Good question whether there is a connection since E3, E3SM V2 and CSM CAM share similar designs like the SE Dicor and higher vertical resolution. So. Yes, yeah, just something that uh, occurred to me when, when I heard uh, the, the talk. So. Would be would be worth exploring and who we want can maybe charm in here oh so well i i don't recall us explicitly uh, turning uh, off the tendencies uh, uh produced by club in e3smv2 but uh, we probably want to clarify that with uh, the e3sm developers other uh, questions for simon um, the MAM-5 volcanic sulfate mode, have you decided on volcanic emissions data sets? On volcanic, uh, so if we have decided emissions. on volcanic emissions data sets, so, yeah. so far we're going to use uh, what we did for CMIP-6. We have the uh, emission data set that was derived earlier, um, and maybe Nick knows better, but on, um, you know, uh, based on, on observations and also on a recent Wacom run, uh, uh, no, uh, no, um, wait, what's the data set? The data set is based on observations that was derived. And at the moment, that's the one we're going to use as well. It's, we haven't really considered a uh, new data set, but is there anything that you uh, are aware of that we should change? Uh, no, I mean, I just want to do some AirCom modeling experiments. Oh, we can discuss offline if you want. Yeah. I want to show you that. Any, yeah, there's the question. I guess maybe this is for Nick, but I'm just I'm just curious about your Seymourization attempt. Uh, like, I guess what are the plans for that? Do you have Do you now have something working, or is it still kind of broken? Are you planning it just for chemistry? Yeah. Yeah. So this was a MIP focused on atmospheric chemistry. So all the outputs atmosphere domain. There's just some invariant fields for the surface that we give. So. It's only working for atmosphere. It's a complete rewrite. Um, yeah, I, I only started to get familiar with the tool, Drek, or whatever it was. Yeah, and I sort of, I think we realized, yeah, maybe it would take less time. It took about a month to get a tool made than to try to wrangle that. Um, yeah, it's working. It's probably not as general as it should be, but you know, it, it basically reads in a very simple, JSON describing some like three things in the run and then it reads in a dictionary JSON to convert between variables and that's it. It points to this MIP stuff so it's pretty independent. It, it sees the connections between the specifications and the dimensions pretty well. Um, it's working. Yeah, I don't know. It's not robust, let's just say. <laughs> no, no, it's still interesting. Well, I guess yeah, Brian Dobbins kind of jumped the but yeah, like obviously we care about that stuff too, so it'd be good maybe in the Yeah, I think, so we had a discussion at a meeting, I don't know, last week, maybe thinking that maybe there's a way to do it online because it's just transforming re and adding attributes in the end. Um, so I don't know, but yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, if, you, if you're all interested, we should, we should talk about that because I, I don't know what the plans are for future MIPS, but I'm imagining to have a good, it, it would be good to have a tool that's easily adapted like that. Thanks. Brian. On the same topic, I know ESM Val tool is trying to incorporate pre-processing workflows, including supporting CESM that will do the seamorization on its own. So we might be able to leverage that group. Yeah, yeah, we had that discussion too in our group. Why wouldn't we actually be able to seamorize right in the model when the model runs, right, with the output? Mm -hmm. Like we can do it with other things. And that yeah, would be online good. would be best, but if yes. we if we still are, if we're stuck doing it offline, yeah, we might be able to get other people to do a lot of the work for us. 
The problem is that many <laughs> new MIPS require other, slightly other variables, slightly other things, and that's where the problem comes in. Yeah, I think though it's like the issue I ran into was that just the you know you pipe it a variable and if it doesn't it, you just you just need to have a dictionary that tells it this variable from this MIP yes it's new but here's what you do and it, that's really not that hard to do some of them are like it needs to be a vertical integral or something or but this is not that hard to program at the end so yeah I think no matter what we do making it adaptive like that is not bad you just you have to actually set out with that purpose so either of these anything that we do would be great it's just it became a real not time waste but it was like we were down to the wire and then it was oh we can't get Seymour to work and the deadline for the MIP is here so we could not face that again I have a question for Julio. Um, you showed a plot of sea level pressure for CAM6 Plus and CAM6 and then mm -hmm. a reanalysis. Everything looked good except for the Tibetan Plateau area where it seems to have gotten worse. I'm wondering what, what's well, going I, on. Well, I, I take sea level pressure over, over land with a grain of salt okay. um, because the, the comparison with observations may, may involve different algorithms for, for calculating sea level pressure. Than are used in the model. So, I, 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 I'm only I'm only concerned with sea level pressure. The sea level pressure variable over ocean. That that's 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 where our problem was, and I, I think that's the only place you can really trust the comparison with analysis. Yeah, I noticed that too yesterday. <laughs> Uh, the rational GFS has 128 layers and it spent only uh, 37 layers in the stratosphere and mesosphere, 80 kilometers tall, leaving 90, 90 layers to the troposphere. What's your basically leverage for 93 level model? Well, um, I mean, 58 levels is about. For 93, 93. Well, levels. I know, but uh, that, 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 since they're identical, more or less, up to the top of L58? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're pretty close to identical up to the top of L58. So I'm just wondering how many layers you also put in PBL. You double number of layers? Well, we, I think we, I don't have, you can, can see in the, in, the, in the slide. I feel like it's at least. Well, that's if you remember, of course. Yeah, no, it's at least, at least that. Hmm. You zoom in on that. I don't know if you're going to, if you just look at the spacing. Um, your slides are... So I don't have any of the right lower now. top or cam, and ours would just show that one had the... We added 10 levels from about 700 hectopascal downward. So, what, and I think there were like 10 already, so there's probably about 20 levels. 20 levels in PBL. In the lowest three kilometers, so... And then it's 500 up through the... So enhancement of level dictated by physics, microphysics, or... Not dynamical core, I believe, right? No, I mean, it was <clears throat> dictated by all of the above. All, 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 all. I mean, we, we, we hope, and I think we may see that, you know, having higher vertical resolution in the free troposphere gives us better better wave propagation, both, you know. No, I mean, in PBL, PBL, I mean, PBL. Oh, in the PBL, yeah, in the PBL, it's, it's physics, mostly. Physics, mostly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Resolving cloud layers, et cetera. And there's a comment. Thank you. Xiao Hong. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Xiao Hong asks, how does uh, long wave cloud forcing look with a higher vertical resolution? I will confess, <coughs> I, I can't answer that question right now. So I'll have a look. I, I th okay, thank you, Julio. Yeah, so the, yeah, the long wave cloud forcing, yeah, the, in CAM6 has a, a low bias. I, I think that there's a kind of long standing bias. I hope with the high resolution model in CAM6++ uh, plus plus with a, a high resolution at up troposphere and that could uh, hopefully uh, improve the ice cloud simulation. Yeah. But, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll go and have a look. <coughs> 
I think uh, we should take a 10 minute break now. Um, this is really just to stretch your legs. There's no coffee provided. <laughs> next time. I think there is no coffee. At least we next think. time. Yeah, we, we don't know. Maybe there. Maybe there. But definitely next break will be coffee and yeah. cookie. Okay, so we're saying ten minutes. So back at back at one fifty. Right. That will put us back on schedule. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's Probably. Good.
Yeah, are we waiting for her to share the screen, I guess? Okay. Um, the slides. There we go. We don't hear you yet, Luisa. Luisa, are you here? I'm here. I couldn't hear you, so I didn't know what was going on. So, <laughs> Good. I'm here. I guess we can now close the chat. You should see you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to give a brief overview of the model independent chemistry module. Even though um, a lot of the CAM configurations don't show, um, don't use detailed chemistry, you're still using some sort of chemistry. So this is relevant for everybody. So our Simone already showed this um, uh, diagram of our goal and vision for Musico, which is really to facilitate uh, making chemistry and aerosols more easily specified in different models and to couple a consistent um, configuration for chemistry and aerosol to any atmosphere model and as in CESM to all of the different modeling components. Um, so this will, this, our goal for Musica and Nikum is to provide flexibility to use different chemistry schemes, different aerosol schemes, um, photolysis calculations, and, um, and as I said, connect to any <coughs> atmosphere models, as well as con connect to the SEMA activities of um, specifying the physics suites. So we have a web page, and there was a BAMS article written a couple years ago on uh, our vision for Musica. So MICM itself contains these components, a database of uh, all the information that goes into specifying reactions and reaction rates, the properties of different chemical species and compounds, and uh, data that goes into the photolysis rate calculation. And then from this database, database we create JSON files that configure the chemistry that are then fed into the MECM software library that interprets the mechanism files, has the chemical solvers, and then connects to any atmosphere model. CAM, MPAS, a box model, uh, the NOAA UFS model, for example, and any other. And another uh, feature of MICM is it has an expandable suite of solvers for chemistry, uh, CPU optimized Rosenbrock, the GPU based solvers, and also solvers for multi-phase systems, gas, uh, aerosol, and aqueous. So the main part of um, parts of MICM now is the database. And we've been using the Chemistry Cafe for a number of years to really provide consistency among um, the Mozart suite of chemical mechanisms that are used in CAMCAM -Cam and WACM, also used for WARFCAM. And so first, one part of it is we have to specify all of the species that might go into the mechanism in this section. And for each one of these, we specify their chemical formula, whether or not it's an aerosol, and can also include all the information about its solubility for uh, a Henry's Law constant, which is used for um, things like wet and dry deposition. Another part of the database specifies photolysis reactions, the species that's being photolyzed and what its products are and what label we're um, currently using for that photolysis rate. It's all edited in a form. And then another section for the kinetic reaction rates, which have two or three reactants and any number of products and of reaction rate and which can be specified in um, various forms. And then also we have a lot of nice ways of filtering uh, the database to look at a uh, specific um, compound and how it's, it's the various reactions it's involved in, also a subset for particular reactions. And then we can easily pick which one of several of these reactions um, we might want in our specific mechanism, and it keeps track of all the historical older versions um, of, of reactions. 
and and we can currently output output export this mechanism in a variety of ways um, and different formats used in CESM or in KPP for WarfChem and this new JSON format that we're using in MICM. So MICM currently runs in a box model as well. It has um, a, a nice browser interface or you can run it just from a command line that we call this music box. And so you can upload an existing mechanism or just create a simple mechanism within the browser, uh, specify time varying environment. Um, and then you run the model within the browser and then can produce um, plot results. So this is a really nice tool for um, classes, atmospheric chemistry classes, and it's been used by a couple groups at Baylor and Arizona. And we had a tutorial on this last uh, last year, and there's a video um, at this web page of that tutorial. And one of the really nice outputs that you can get from the browser-based version is this integrated rate flow diagram that shows you how different compounds are connected and the relative rates that um, form and destroy each of them, which will be a really valuable tool for understanding more complex chemistry, not just uh, ozone, simple ozone uh, scheme shown here. And um, one more feature of Music Box, we're working on having this run completely on the web. Currently, it runs in a Docker uh, system container, but um, it will be available online um, very soon. So some of the features of MICM, it's really being designed so it can be easily connected to any model, not just CESM, but we are actively working on getting this fully coupled to CAMCAM um, with and without uh, CCPP right now. It stands, uh, builds as a standalone software library. So you don't need to include any code um, to use MICM. You can just link to it. Uh, has well-defined API, um, so you don't need to modify any of your source code and you just use it like a net CDF library. And MECM will have 80% coverage by unit tests, means that um, hopefully it's all working the way you intend it and uh, eliminate difficult bug searches. And I'll stop there. Are there any questions? Thank you, Louisa. Point out that even the simple chem model is part of MICM, right? The simple chemistry. So that is relevant for all the working groups. That's right. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Louisa. And this might this might be a question more for like Matt or Francis or something. But uh, what? what is the interface going to look like? Is it going to be similar to like the abstract aerosol interface or it's just kind of a common call set or I guess what's the, or maybe is, is the API documented? I guess it could be in there. I'm just curious what that, that API looks like or we talk about it at all. I'm not sure that's, uh, well, there's something that's in music box. I don't know. Matt promised to be online to answer the questions. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, Matt. Um, yeah, so the API is still being developed, but um, I think, yeah, similar probably to the abstract aerosol interface, the idea is that it should be reusable in different models. So we want to be sure not to uh, insert dependencies on one particular model. So work um, to develop the API so that it is configurable in that way. But yeah, definitely still work in progress. All right, no worries. Thanks, Matt and Louisa. Any other questions for Luisa? If not, we'll go on to uh, Haiping. Uh, I hope he is online as well, and I assume he's going to share the slides. Is that correct? I don't know. I am. It doesn't seem like I can share my screen. Yeah. Are you able to share your screen? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, so he's going to talk about the harmonized emission component, HEMCO, as I already introduced. Uh, 
that is a very useful component, we hope, especially for uh, future uh, all kind of new grids that are going to be developed. And yeah, uh, take it away, Haipeng. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Haipeng Lin. I'm from the Atmospheric Chemistry Modeling Group at Harvard. And today, my presentation is on the harmonized emissions component as a, a multi-model emissions component for uh, implemented in Musica and ChemChem. So the motivation for a new emissions and data tool for CSM came from the Musica project and also the implementation of GeoSchem chemistry within CSM. Um, emissions are a central component in atmospheric, in, uh, atmospheric chemistry where large data sets from emission inventories need to be combined and pre-processed onto the model grid and onto the target chemical species for a particular mechanism. The source data is often on different resolutions, formats, and there is often the need to scale, mask, and overlay emissions um, for a particular simulation. Uh, the current workflow in many models often needs this pre-processing to be done with just um, ad hoc tools and for regrading and for combining of emissions, making this a tedious process and highly storage intensive because you have to store the emissions data on the model grid for the entire simulation time for each specific simulation. So a unified emissions and data tool would aim to complete all these tasks in an online fashion to eliminate this pre-processing step of creating simulation specific emission files. An online emissions tool also allows for the better integration of dynamics and neurology effects on emissions and allow for better sharing of data and reproducing of the workflow. So PEMCO was originally developed by Christoph Keller in 2014 for the GSCAM model. It's an online emissions component that unified emissions and data processing for GSCAM. So in PEMCO, the scaling, masking, and the choice of inventories with PEMCO is as simple as flipping a switch in this text-based configuration file, making sensitivity experiments for day-to-day -day choice of inventories possible without any modification of the underlying NetCDF data or the code. With the new version of HEMCO version 3, HEMCO is now operational in models beyond GSCAM, such as Musica, CAMCAM, or um, GSCAM implemented within CESM. The heart of HEMCO is the HEMCO configuration file, this text-based file, which specifies the relationship between the source net CDF input data and the data provided to the model. Each emissions entry in HEMCO is a data container that is passed through a series of scaling factors and masks and then passed on to the model. Each data container kind of looks like this in the configuration file. It maps one variable in the NetCDF file to um, one species in the model. The available time range um, for each file can be specified along with a cycling option that specifies the behavior for matching the date slices in the file to the model time. Scaling factors can be applied for masking and scaling, and data can be identified with a category and a hierarchy number, where um, data in the same category will always use data from higher hierarchy when available. So this would allow for regional inventories to supersede global inventories when available. So putting it together, this a set of data container entries together form each collection of emission inventories as shown here, for example, the SETS emission inventory and the MEIC emission inventory. The HEMCO configuration file contains these major sections outlining the available collections, um, data containers, and scale factors and masks. The HEMCO configuration file only needs to be tweaked for the species mapping so it can match the species for each individual chemical mechanism, but otherwise the underlying source data um, come from the same HEMCO emissions database throughout all models. So this will enable the sharing of code and data over all models that adopt HEMCO. Excuse me, Hi Peng. Uh, yes. Could you adjust your microphone? It's coming in a little bit too hot for us. Uh, I'm sorry, so a little, um, for, to reduce the volume a little bit? Yes, please. I'm sorry about that. Um, um, is this better? Much better, thank you. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. And um, HEMCO CESM on this interface is the new uh, first new model implementation of the restructured HEMCO 3.0. Um, this implementation of HEMCO CESM is based on the ionosphere interface in CAM and it creates kind of a base environment used for HEMCO CESM. 
This allows HEMCO and CESM to be sort of a mini emissions model self-contained inside CESM and it operates in a way that it's on its own grid and MPI environment such that it can serve the outside model environment regardless of which grid is being used in the atmosphere. So ESMF is used to regrid to and from the HEMCO grid to the atmospheric grid. Currently, the HEMCO grid where HEMCO operates the emissions mask and scaling internally is a regular uh, lat long grid, but um, this is simply because uh, first we haven't implemented the ESMF regridding from the input data to HEMCO itself, but also because uh, the input data in HEMCO uh, emission <coughs> database right now is uh, mostly in rectilinear lat long formats. But this in no way affects the model side of things. Any grid in the CAM model, including structured and unstructured grids, can be used together with HEMCO. So this structure has the unique advantage of kind of being independent uh, implemented outside chemistry. So HEMCO is agnostic of the chemical scheme or the rest of the configuration within CAM and also capable of potentially feeding data to other components in the atmosphere. Um, and um, it works. HEMCO is fully op operational in the CESM model as an emissions tool for chemistry on both regular and spectral element grids. Um, shown here is kind of a test output from HEMCO for the NO flux at surface on the Korea spectral element grid, uh, courtesy of Dusong. And HEMCO internally is feeding data um, at a 0.15 times 0.15 degree resolution but this resolution can always be changed depending on how fine the source data is. And HEMCO emissions can be provided or distributed over the vertical for 3D emissions on any grid through the regridding of the source data to the model grid at runtime. Um, the data is not available, uh, not just in the physics buffer for runtime use within the code, but also can be output uh, in the CAM history for verification. Emissions are grouped by species, so there are fields like HEMCO NO, MCO NO2, et cetera, and they are updated at every time step, uh, but HEMCO only reads data from disk as necessary. So if you have a daily um, updated NetCDF file, but with hourly scaling factors or diurnal variation, HEMCO would only read the files at every day, but not, not at every hour. And I have given a more extensive tutorial presentation uh, with detailed instructions to work with HEMCO in CAMCAM -Cam Musica and this is available on the CAMCAM -Cam wiki. Um, Git repositories of the code are also available, split into the HEMCO core code, which contains all the emissions processing code that is shared among all the models implementing HEMCO, the interface to CESM, and configuration files for um, different concepts in CAMCAM -Cam and also JSCAM within CESM. And also there's a generic HEMCO user's guide, which applies to all the models adopting HEMCO, and um, the original references. And currently, HEMCO is in the progress of being merged into CSM mainline. And thus, um, right now, if you want to use it, you still need a particular fork of CAM, which is compatible with um, CSM 2.1. But we expect this to be pulled into mainline um, very, very soon. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I think maybe you can clarify when we when this is implemented, right? The user name list will look differently, and there will be mm -hmm. it will not be anymore what we are used to that we point to the emissions like the aerosols in chem or other chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you. So. So the, use, the user name list in CAM would just have an entry that points to the HEMCO configuration file path. And there, um, you would have to tweak the emissions within the HEMCO configuration file format. So this is so that we can, uh, every model can use kind of like the same templates. Um, so this would not look exactly like um, uh, how emissions are fed into, into CAM right now, where the, the files are specified in the name list. There's a question, Adam. Uh, I just have one clarifi quick clarification. So you, you could basically uh, reproduce the CAM6 climate by using HEMCO and just pointing to the CAM6 emissions files as the source files. There would be differences, of course, because of the different interpolation workflows, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, it should be scientifically the same climate. Yes. Okay. Actually, I would say 
say it would be bit for bit, right? If you point to the CESM emission files through HEMCO and interpolate in the same way as we now do in the default case, which is something that is included, then that should actually be bit for bit. Is that correct? Um, I have not tried it. I believe it should, but um, so Hamco internally has a grid resolution, so you would have to tweak that to match um, the input file because otherwise there may be some some um, regrading going on that may may change some results. But I I, uh, I would expect if we configure the grid and the the interpolation to be exactly the same, it should be bit for bit. Thank you. Okay, Blair, as long as you can already come up, maybe. Are there more questions? Well, I'll just get, in terms of that interpolation, does the user have control over, like, because you have the ESMF regridding between HAM and, and HEMCO, does the user have any control over that, or you kind of assigned it always has to be whatever, you know, some sort of Oh, the, the user has uh, absolute control over this, so you are able to change the resolution of how HEMCO treats uh, the emissions internally. Because um, even if you're running on a very high resolution grid and you only have, say, low resolution input data as, a, as an example, then you would want to make sure that the Hamco grid is not finer than the finest resolution that's being input, because otherwise there would be, you can save computational resources that way. Um, so this is all configurable in the name list. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. So I think we are going to share uh, the next talk again, which is um, number, oh. you want to do it? Okay, the next speaker is uh, Du Sanjo, and he will uh, talk about the new simplified parameterization for secondary organic aerosols. Okay. Oh, there's an like echo. Oh. And just turn off this microphone. Oh, it's a bit turned off. Okay, yeah. Is it better now? It still looks like there's some echo. Well, maybe I can just hold this hand far away. <laughs> I think it should work right now. Okay, okay. So yeah, <clears throat> uh, let me start this presentation again. So first, uh, I'd like to explain why organic aerosol is important for our system modeling. So this figure uh, shows uh, different aerosol compositions measured by aerosol mass spectrometer globally. And you can see this figure that organics uh, in green color uh, contributes substantial mass fractions of some micron aerosols. And this organic aerosol can be further classified into two different organic aerosols. One is primary organic aerosol or primary organic matter in CSM. Oh. Okay. And the other is secondary organic aerosol in purple color here. And you can see that from this pie chart, uh, secondary organic aerosol dominates the total organic aerosol concentrations. And organic aerosol is also important in terms of the radiation balance. So this paper uh, calculated aerosol optical depth and direct radiative effect by different types of aerosols. 
And you can see in the upper right side, uh, these papers are calculated organic aerosol, aerosol depths and direct radiative effect. And you can see here that organic aerosol is also important in terms of radiation over Africa, Asia, and South America region. Now let's look at the CSM as a scheme. So this table is from Simon's paper in 2019. And this paper actually used two different SOA schemes. So one is in the red color, so CAM SOA scheme, the other CAM CAM SOA scheme. And this table calculated the global atmospheric burden of SOA, POM, black carbon, and sulfate. And you can see on the right side, you can see some relative differences caused by SOA scheme. And for SOA, of course, you can see this 14% difference. But also for primary organic matter and black carbon, you can see there's about 20% differences caused by SOA scheme. So the goal of this study is to get consistent SOA concentrations between this CAM SOA scheme and CAM CAM SOA scheme. And we can expect uh, black carbon and primary organic matter can be also uh, consistent between these two models. And finally, uh, because those uh, react with uh, solar radiation, so we can get consistent radiation fields. So this is the summary of our new parameterization. Uh, I know this is really heavy, it's busy, but please don't be scared. We'll go through it step by step. So, and I won't go into the details. I'll just briefly explain which parts have been changed. So actually this slide has three parts. So CAM CAM at the top and CAM in the middle and the new scheme for CAM at the bottom. And we updated emissions so that we can use now these online biogenic emissions from CLM output. But the default CAM actually used these offline biogenic emissions that need some pre-processing. And also in terms of VOCs, which is a precursor of secondary organic aerosols, we also updated the VOC tracers in CAM. Now you can see that the new CAM and CAM CAM have the same VOC tracers, but in the middle, the default CAM used different VOCs, and also there is some arbitrary scaling factor for 50% increase of SOA in CAM, but we don't need this scaling factor anymore. And also in terms of chemistry, CAM CAM, of course, explicitly simulate all the VOC reactions and oxidation process, but CAM actually uh, just directly emit SOA emissions to SOA. So there's no intermediate process at all. But because in the real atmosphere, we need some time to form SOA from this VOC chemistry, so we added another tracer with one day lifetime to delay the formation of SOA. And actually it helped the vertical distribution by a lot. We'll see the result later. And also in terms of SOA in the model, CAM can use five different volatility beans, but CAM use just one bean. And again, our new scheme use one bean, but parameters were updated to be consistent with SOA scheme in CAM CAM. And also there are some missing uh, loss processes in CAM for SOA here. So we updated it, so now CAM CAM and CAM have the same loss processes for SOA. And finally, this is the table for computational cost. And uh, this is average computational cost with parentheses showing some variability of computational cost on Cheyenne caused by computational environment. And you can see that there's variability is about 100 and we add about 50 or 60 to this default CAM simulation. So I think uh, this additional computational cost is not that significant. So now let's look at the model results. So first, uh, I'd like to show you, I'm sorry, uh, this seasonal ladies and vertical distribution. So first, upper three figures show some monthly variations of SOA on the left and black carbon in the middle and POA, primary organic matter in CSM on the right side and lower uh, three panels show vertical distributions by three different model configurations. And this is based on one year result with notching for 2013. 
And you can clearly see that for black lines and green lines, they are well matched each other after this update, especially for this northern hemispheric winter time as well. And also for black carbon and primary gain aerosol, we can get more consistent result with this new update on SOA. And also for this vertical distribution, uh, you can see that around 100 hectopascal can actually overestimate this 100 hectopascal SOA, but this overestimation disappeared with the new aerosol scheme. And if you look at the spatial distribution of this uh, SOA at around 100 hectopascal, then again, you can see uh, there is big improvement with the new aerosol scheme on the right side compared to CAM CAM on the left. And the default CAM in the middle, uh, you can see there is some significant overestimation globally. And also same plot but for 500 hectopascal, again, the new CAM and CAM CAM show very similar distributions, but default CAM failed to simulate as way around 500 hectopascal. And as I mentioned earlier, SOA scheme also affects black carbon and primary gain aerosol. So again, the right column for a new aerosol scheme in CAM and CAM CAM on the left side shows similar distributions, although this is not perfect. But at least for some high bias over the Arctic region for black carbon and primary gain aerosol disappeared in this new aerosol scheme. And these high bias over Arctic region actually resulted in some bias of short wave flux, as you can see from this zonal average plot. So all those six plots are for zonal average, but for short wave, long wave, and the bottom panels are for cloud brushing. And you can see that for, and these lines are for difference between CAM and CAM CAM. And you can see that uh, from these default CAM simulations, there is some high bias over the Arctic region due to high black carbon and primary gain aerosol loading over there. But these were disappeared. And this high bias is probably due to short wave cloud brushing. But also I think it is caused by some direct radiative effect because aerosol scatter sunlight. So this is again based on the one year result. So we actually conducted further simulations, so historical run results. So here we use uh, 60 years uh, averages. So model is still running right now, so we will eventually use 10 years averages. But for today's presentation, we used 60 years for each period for each model case. And again, you can see that in terms of those free running historical run result, the black bars and green bars are well matched each other compared to these blue bars, which is default cam we are using right now. So those are for SOABC and POA. And again, I'd like to show some radiation balance. So this uh, upper part shows some short wave flux at the top of the model and on the right side, the long wave flux. And again, you can see the black bars and green bars are closer than these blue bars in the middle. And here the bottom uh, panel, you can see some short wave plus long wave flux at the top of the model. Again, you can see this the high bias over the Arctic region um, from this 1850s run and also 2000 run. But interestingly, if you calculate radiative forcing, so the difference between the 2000 and 1850 runs, then those are disappeared because those are just canceled out. But still, in terms of global mean radiative forcing aspect, so we uh, can see some improvements. So CAM CAM shows in, the, in this case, CAM CAM shows radiative forcing of 0 0.3, but uh, CAM shows some minus value, but with the new scheme, uh, the difference was decreased. So let me summarize uh, today's presentation. So first, organic aerosol is important for uh, our system modeling. So to get some consistent result between CAM and CAM, CAM, we developed a new parameterization. And with this new SOA scheme, we could get more consistent temporal and spatial distributions of carbonaceous aerosols. And also in terms of radiation flux, especially over the Arctic region, we could get improved result in terms of consistency between CAM-CAM and CAM. So yeah, that's it.
Thank you for your attention. Uh, I was wondering if you can make a comment on how the new SOA scheme affects the BC and the uh, primary organics concentration. Oh. Yeah. I think Simone and Xiaohong Cole knows better than me, but uh, I think there is some aging process from the primary mode of carbon and shear cell soups like black carbon and primary organic matter. So that's the way condensation and coagulation and the other microphysics affect those because we share the main four beam. So for accumulation mode, for example, black carbon and primary organic matter and secondary aerosol, all they are in this uh, accumulation mode. So it affects it through microphysics. Mary? Yeah, nice, very nice talk, Isan. Um, I was curious how you chose that one day time scale to go from the gas phase to the aerosol phase, and if you did any sensitivity tests to go with that. Oh, yeah, that's actually a very good question. So we just chose one day lifetime uh, based on my experience from SOA world, because we typically assume the one day lifetime to make some organic aerosol aging. That's also used in geoschem site for primary organic aerosol. But if you translate that one day lifetime to OH reactivity, then if you uh, use some global average OH reactivity, which is about, I think, 1.5, 10 to the 6 molecules per cubic centimeter, then if you assume some typical reaction constant like 10 to the minus 11, something, then that is exactly the one day lifetime. So I think that is some typical global mean OH uh, reactions for these brioches. So can I follow up with, don't you think it might change from region to region? And, and then if you go to Musica, will that be a factor? If... Oh yeah, that's a good question. So I think it does affect the distribution. Uh, so if we can use some uh, diamondly varying OH for chem, I think that's for new chem 7 or maybe next version of development, then if we can use the better OH fields for CAM, then we can just change the one day lifetime to some reaction constant for OH. In that case, we will get more flexible. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, we can have another question. Just to do OH, at the moment, uh, we prescribe OH monthly fields or even yeah, something like that. And obviously we can't get there, we don't have a diurnal cycle, but there's also hope that maybe the HIMCO tool may be able to somehow integrate a diurnal cycle in this. So we, we're still exploring this, and that's certainly something that, that can uh, further improve, like you're saying. And then there will be more improvements uh, also to be made for Kim. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um. Great talk. I'm excited to see the fixes on blood carbon and particular organic matter. Um, I'm curious with the changes that have been made between CAM and your new CAM simulation, what process would you have you seen has the biggest impact on your SOA? Is it your online biogenic source, the depo adding deposition, or the photolysis loss? What's the, do you think was the most impactful to helping reduce transport of black carbon and POM? Uh, honestly, I don't know the answer. Okay, I, I was just curious if any it's sensitivity it's test, but I guess uh, this additional tracer to delay the formation the effect because it affects the spatial distribution. And the, for black carbon and primary gain matter side, spatial distribution was a big problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess yeah, yeah that's the most impactful. Cool. So yeah, it might be interesting to see how that changes when you have that online OH. Thanks. Other questions? Online, anything? We don't know. Maybe we should check. Um, and then we have the next speaker, I think. There's a question. Is there a question? Just for Rafael. 
from uh, my question was exactly the same. Okay, from Rafa, and then there's one from Xiao Hong. Do you want to say something, Xiao Hong, while we transition? No, no, my question is answered. So I just say similar the approach, similar like the uh, one product model. Previously, we, the SOE for me had two product model. Right now, it's only one, one cap, yeah, one species now. And the, 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 the prescribed one, one day came, maybe it depends on OH. I think, yeah, this is already discussed. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so our next speaker, I think, will share her screen, which will be Sarah Deutsch, the incorporation of volcanic ash into CEFS. Go ahead, we're looking forward. Um, give me a second to get my sh screen shared. Let's see. All right. Um, sorry, I'm having some trouble letting it, getting it to share with you. It would be number seven. I think we could download and share. Should we do that again or? Do you um, hopefully it will work now, I think. Okay, yeah, try. It's fine. Well, just in case. All right. Yeah, it might not. It might not let me do that. I can share it. Um, I'm sorry. If I go back, oh, first we have to go back to that. Yeah, we can share it for you, and I can advance the slides. Um, yeah. Okay, that would be great. I'm sorry. It's fine. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. okay. So this shouldn't be an issue. Um, there's one video that probably won't be able to be played, um, but other than that, everything should work fine with this. So um, my name is Sarah Deitch. I'm a grad student at Cornell University, and I'm working with Natalie Mahowald and a host of other people on the project to work on the incorporation of volcanic ash into the CESM. Um, so if we could scroll down. And no slideshow, right? Do you want a slideshow? So now you should see it. Do you see it? There we go. Okay, now we can see. Sorry for that. No, that's good. All right, so um, volcanic emissions have been recognized in the past for their impact on the Earth system. Um, specifically, what people tend to focus on for these studies are sulfuric emissions. Um, and that's just because when a volcano erupts, the sulfur has a huge impact on the temperature and that's of great interest. So that's incorporated into Earth system models already. Um, and while ash has been studied in certain circles, um, its impact to the Earth system has not been widely recognized and it has not been incorporated into glo global Earth system models such as the CESM. So if we go to the next slide. Um, the purpose of this project, or at least our specific Part of it is that we're trying to quantify the impacts of ash by doing a smaller study to determine if it is worthwhile to be included in the climate models. And the impacts that we're interested in looking in are the biogeochemistry, the impacts on air quality, which then has spin-offs to impact human health, um, transportation, as you might have heard, um, volcanic ash has historically had huge impacts on the transportation industry, specifically aircrafts, um, because it grounds flights. And this can have a huge on remote sensing, um, in situ chemistry work. Um, and our purpose, our goal in the project is to incorporate volcanic ash into the CESM. And that's what I've been working on. So next slide. 
So the steps that I've taken so far for this project are to work on freeing up room within an existing dust version of the model to incorporate the tracer. And then I'm specifically looking at the 2010 eruption of Aya Lyoko, which we just call Aya. Um, this was an eruption in Iceland that had a huge impact on the airline industry. Um, and it was also specifically chosen because we have uh, good data because this was after um, certain satellites were up and able to be getting some good images of um, volcanic ash at the time. Um, unfortunately, there was some, it was a very cloudy time, but we chose it for that reason. Um, and then once the model has been working, we're working on compares, comparing our output with the other data. So remote sensing in C2, and then also previous model results and tuning the model accordingly. We're hoping to get a good description of this model of this eruption, and then we can look at its impact on radiative forcing and regional weather. And we can look into the ocean version of the model to look at the biogeochemistry. Next slide. So the model set, the setup that I have in the CESM, I'm using CESM version two, and I'm working with CAM6. Specifically, there's a speciated dust version um, at Lee et al. 2020, and this has eight dust tracers in it. Um, this is also using modal aerosol model version four, and I'm also using a version of the model, the mechanism of intermediate complexity for modeling iron, which um, has eight iron tracers as well. And then in once we have a working version of the model, we can look at the biogeochemical elemental cycle to look at the impacts that the ash has on um, biogeochemistry when it deposits downwind of the eruption. Next slide. So I began by altering an existing of the model, existing version of the model that has eight dust tracers and eight iron tracers that I mentioned previously. And so what this was able to do is I was able to free up room within the model to put the ash in, and I can use some different optical properties that already existed in the model to simulate the ash without having to encode in an entirely new tracer. Um, and then using some eruptive data that we got from collaborators, I was creating input files of various sizes and compositions of the ash. Um, and then once it's in the model, we're now in the step of optimizing the input files to best match these observations. Um, and I'll get into that in more detail um, in a couple slides. So the existing framework for the ash tracer, or for the for the dust tracers that then became the ash. Um, there are eight types of dust separated into different mineralogies and each of these tracers had um, different optics. So I was able to combine four of these tracers together um, to free up space so that I could have four ash tracers that would go in. Um, and we separated those out based on their chemi chemical composition and their optics to try to optimize the amount of diversity we had in the ash that we could represent while still um, working with what we had. And so we had to combine um, four of the dust tracers that you wouldn't lose too much of the information that it was storing in the in the dust version of the model. So it wouldn't impact the AOD of the dust too much if we kind of just condensed it. So um, on the future slide, I'll show which ones we condensed together. Um, next slide. And a lot of the choices that we're making depended on the optical properties of the ash, because um, how we set these optical properties, it would lead to either net warming or cooling impacts of the ash. Um, and we had eight initial optics to trust to choose from. So we had um, light and dark, we had hematite and quartz essentially. And then we also wanted to separate calcite because of um, the chemical impacts. And then feldspar had to be kept separate for ice nucleation. Um, so the iron bearing aerosols were separated for biogeochemistry impacts and also just because that would go into the, the dark optical section. Um, and then the salts we left into the optically light section. So on the next slide, I'll show the breakdown. So we started with these eight optics on the left. And then when we moved it around, we combined um, illite, kaolinite, mont quartz and gypsum together and we just put those under quartz optics um, and then we left hematite calcite and feldspar separate for the reasons that i listed on the previous slide and then the ash we were able to separate it out into four to sig types we had the iron bearing and dark glasses we had bright mineralogy feldspar separate for ice nucleation and we had salts and those are the associated optics on the right if we could go to the next slide um, and the assumptions that i made under using the MAM4 version of the model. I, I chose the size distribution kind of arbitrarily knowing that I would need to optimize it later. So I put the majority into the course mode um, and then 
1% into accumulation and 0.1 into, into the Aiken mode. Um, I know I'm going to have to tune this later, and but we're also going to hold off on that because um, Zhao Hong Lu's group is working on an extra course mode. Um, and Long Wei Li in our group is also working on this. And we're hoping to get that version in, into the model because a lot of volcanic ash is actually bigger than the diameter that's included in the course mode. And this is going to fall out really quickly. A large portion of the mass is going to go in there. So our course mode is going to decrease there and the extra course mode will take over um, the dominant. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, we got the composition by Adrian Hornby and it left us with no salts actually. And the majority of the ash is in the bright mineralogy section. Um, and pretty much equally distributed into the iron bearing and dark glasses and to the volcanic feldspar as well. So next slide. Um, and this is what the input file that we received from Federico Galetto, who is also um, working on this project. Um, it's varying on a sub daily time scale. The plume height varies and as well as the masses. And this was the information that we used to, to go into the model. Next slide. And then we made some assumptions about the vertical profile as well. I did some tests to see how much varying the um, vertical plume um, would impact the model. And it turns out that it did not impact it very greatly, but I chose a constant mixing ratio for the vertical distribution and kept it varying with the plume height and the total mass in the plume on that sub daily uh, scale that we have going into the model. And those are the assumptions that I made. So our current simulation, yeah, we could go to the next slide now. Um, this is a video, but it's not going to play here. Um, it's just showing the transport of the AOD. We can just skip to the next slide and it shows the average AOD over the month. So I ran it for 50 days, um, give or take. And this is the average AOD um, coming out of the erupt out of the eruptive site. Um, we can see that it's a fairly high AOD um, near the eruptive site. It's about four um, and the the globally average AOD for the ash for all dates is pretty small, um, but there's about 10 or 15 days of no eruption at the beginning there. And if we go to the next slide, we have a plot of the AOD over time over the baseline for dust that the model was putting out. So that horizontal line is showing about where the dust AOD is. And um, you can see that when the eruption starts, which is about April 14th, um, the AOD quickly increases. Um, and this is on a globally average AOD. We can go to the next slide. So the portion of the project that I'm now going into is tuning the model to observation. So we're looking at the AOD. This is from the MODIS satellite. Um, and we're working with some people at JPL to look at the satellite data. Um, and we're going to go through the cycle of um, correcting some of the assumptions that we made going into the model. Specifically, we can look back into the vertical profile um, the size distribution is going to be a big one. And also we're going to have to tune the mass um, because we're making some assumptions from um, the data that we got. But if we're seeing a large difference from what the satellites are showing us, then um, we'll tune it accordingly. Unfortunately, with the, um, with the satellite observations, it was extremely cloudy. So out of the total eruption, which lasted a, over a month, there's only two days where it's not completely covered by clouds. So we'll be looking at April 19th and 20th really really uh, closely for most of the observations. And if we go to the next slide, um, I'm currently doing a literature, literature review to do some other, to gather some other data on different observations that were taken potentially from the ground um, and also just some, getting some other model data for comparisons. And then I'll go through the process of tuning it and then quantifying the impacts. So um, next slide, thanks for listening. And I'll take any questions now. Hello, Zhao Hong. Hi, yeah, Sarah, thank you for your presentation. And uh, oh, uh, maybe I missed this. Uh, what is the size distribution and the uh, and the mass flux of the uh, emitted uh, volcanic uh, ash you used in the model. 
Yeah, so I'm using 98.9% in the course mode, 1% in the accumulation mode, and 0.1% in the um, Aiken mode, but that is definitely subject to change, especially once we uh, include the ultra course mode. And um, mm -hmm. that was an assumption made because the size distribution does vary wildly depending on like the timing of the eruption. Um, we could look into cha uh, changing the size distribution in different eruptive phases. That's another um, way that we could tune the model going forward is changing either the, chem uh, the composition of the eruption over time in different eruptive periods, changing the size distribution, even changing how it's distributed in the plume. Um, but so far, we just made the most simple assumptions going into it um, okay. because the mass is so dominant in the in the larger scale part particles from an eruption. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So how do you give them uh, ash uh, mass? So the burden, so it's the, it, it, how do they estimate, estimate the ash amount? So, you know. The total mass going in? Yeah, 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 total mass, yeah. Oh, there's a data set taken from actual like ground-based observations from Federico Galetto, who's one of the collaborators on the project. And there's um, mm -hmm. some daily data for the total eruptive mass leaving the volcano, as well as the total maximum plume height at that, at those different stages in the eruption. And so um, that's what okay. I put into my input data. And then I did the composition okay. um, of that from information by Adrian Hornby to separate it into the four um, ash types that I generated. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks again uh, to all the speakers in the session. And uh, we will now go to our coffee break. And then we'll meet back here five minutes after three uh, for the next session. Okay, thank you.
going for the group dinner. Pay by yourself, basically. Oh, oh, yeah. Unfortunately, yes. Just yeah. making sure we're people. Not, we're not. We're not going to be able to fund <laughs> yeah. You're going to pick up this afternoon. <laughs> I could try charging on one of my cards. No, <laughs> just kidding. They only take cash, though. Remember that. Oh, oh, that's right. They're back there. Oh, they have a machine. I don't know. This. Yeah, they have the, a cash they machine. There's okay. an ATM in, yeah. in, in there. Yeah. Just take checks. <laughs> All right. You want to be that person? Yeah. 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 Our first, our first talk is on the new uh, atmosphere diagnostics, uh, which will be given by uh, Justin Rickling. And uh, slideshow. Oh, right. There we go. All right, Justin. All right. Come Thank on. you, Julio. Uh, test. Does the microphone work? Everyone good? Awesome. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming back from the break. Hope everyone's caffeinated. Um, my name is Justin Richling, and I'm an associate scientist here at CGD in the Atmospheric Modeling and Predictability Group. And I'm here to talk about diagnostics today. So, um, specifically the new generation of ANWG diagnostics. I'm sure a lot of you folks are familiar with it, so let's jump right in. And this is uh, it's the AMWG diagnostics framework henceforth called the ADF. So what is it? As I mentioned before, it is a new set of Python um, diagnostic tools aimed at replacing the old NCL going the way of the dodo bird package, um, which is a sad thing. You know, it's the end of an era. Um, and just like the, the old tool set, it's designed to sort of uh, compare different CAM simulations against each other, against observational data, or against reanalysis data. Um, but the new and improved ADF uh, is gonna allow for multiple tests versus the baseline, whereas the old one, it was you were kind of limited to one case versus baseline. And I'm gonna talk plenty about the multiple case um, later on. And just like the old one, it, it's, it's only set to run for monthly means as of right now, so, you know, we're working on maybe trying to get that into different time frames uh, to be announced. So, what do we get out of this? Um, we get a slew of time series CLIMO files, and if it's applicable, regridded NetCVF files. Um, we get a whole host of plots, and I have just a couple quick examples of some of these uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. And there's also an optional website generation uh, it creates HTML, pretty basic HTML files uh, on your local drive that you can open up in a web browser and kind of navigate through these different plots. So I just wanted to kind of talk briefly about some of the key features and what's new compared to the old package, and they're not mutually exclusive, but um, as I mentioned there, maybe I didn't mention it, it is open source and it is flexible, flexible meaning uh, we left it uh, kind of customizable. You know, we have a, a core set of diagnostic tools, but it's really available for scientists to make it their own. Um, we do have a limited use of the GeoCat package, which you're, if you're unfamiliar is sort of NCAR's uh, pivot to Python initiative. So this is where we sort of transition away from the NCL base. Um, we use YAML config files, which if you're unfamiliar with YAML files, they're just a standard sort of text config file that really just helps you put your standard, uh, I guess, parameters in these files. So you don't have to add it into the source code. Keep that nice and clean. Um, and I, I'll have a couple examples of those a bit later on as well. Um, we do have the option to sort of set how many processors you want to run for the ADF, so that can help speed things up because it is, it is a big package. It does take a lot of computation. Um, we have a great vertical inter interpolation scheme, and I bolded that because I got a little bit more information on the next slide about that. Um, it also runs via Conda Package Manager, so hopefully most folks now are kind of familiar with Conda and how easy it is to make your own environments isolated to keep things playing nicely. And if you're lucky enough to be on a sizzle machine, you have a really easy installation kind of out of the box. And there's a link to our GitHub if you're not on how to sort of set this up. Um, what's new? We got a couple good things coming in from the old 
the old package, one thing is Jupyter Notebooks. You know, they're kind of taking the scientific community by storm. It makes life a lot easier. It's got the cell nature. You can isolate different parts of the, the ADF. So if you're only looking to, for me, it's great for developing. So you can test out your new script, put it in there without having to run the full ADF through the command line. So it's very flexible. And it comes with a, a sample, sample notebook in the ADF. Uh, Multi-case diagnostics, I sort of touched on that a little earlier and we'll, we'll see some examples. Um, we do have the climate uh, variability diagnostics um, sort of running, tan the option to run tandem with the ADF. It runs kind of in the background so it doesn't, doesn't mess with the ADF but you can also just tag that along. We now have uh, QBO diagnostics in there as well. And we're working for TEM diagnostics and time series plots and all the ones with the double stars up there just mean it's in progress, not in production just yet. So the vertical interpolation, I'm not gonna say everything on here, but I just wanted to let you sort of read this and have this up here. It's a great way to um, sort of work with any model variable that has a vertical um, component. Um, specifically, it allows now for the 3D models to be compared against 3D observations, assuming that they're on the same set of pressure levels. Um, it also allows the compatibility with MPAS data. It's, uh, it will also sort of work with that to get it onto the standard pressure levels that I just spoke about in the ADF. So the YAML files, this is one of kind of two main ones that we have, and this one's optional, but this one is great because this allows you to set almost any parameter you want for your variables. Each and every variable, specific variables, whatever you want, it's very flexible, so you don't, again, have to put any of this stuff hard-coded into the source code. So just as a quick example, the one on the left, relative humidity, you can set color maps, contour ranges, all that, fun stuff. You can change the unit if you don't like how it comes out of the cam output file. You can give it a new unit. Um, there's even options that you can specify which observation file if you're going against observations. If you like, you want relative humidity for the, the era I, you can go ahead and claim that one. Um, you can define your own configurations. On the left, um, you know, as Julio had mentioned, the Labrador C is always kind of a pain. So running time series to help CAM7 development, you can make a quick subset for the lab C. And then you just run it in your time series so you don't have to hard code that into the plotting script. The other main YAML file is the actual config file that the ADF is actually looking for when it goes to run. So this is a hodgepodge of just little snippets. It's a pretty big file. Um, but this is where you set your case your case name, where the data, the CAMHIST files are located, where you want the diagnostics to go. Um, up at the top left is where you sort of set your plotting script. You can turn those on and off if you want. This is where you would call your own script if you've added it in there. Uh, the bottom set is kind of how you set the CVEP. And on the right is just the list of uh, variables you want to run with the ADF. So this is just a a small subset. So once you've, and you can call it whatever you want as long as the ADF knows what it's called. Um, once you're done setting all of the fun stuff, now it's time to run it. So in the base of the ADF directory, just a quick script, run ADF diag, you call that new YAML file, and you're on your way. It starts out making time series files. So what do we get out of this? If you, and I should say the, the website generation is, is an option inside of the, that YAML file. So if you decide to do it, this is what you get as a single case output. So unfortunately I don't have time to do a sort of exploratory um, uh, navigation of this website, but each of these plot types, you'll click on it, you'll go to a new page, it'll have all the variables that you are set for that plot type. You can click on your favorite variable and then you'll have a list of um, time frames that are for the plot. So you'll have the annual, you can have uh, seasonal weighted, all four of the seasonal weighted times. Um, and when you do that, you can kind of, I just wanna show you quick, real quick um, for time's sake what some of these plots look like. And you've seen a couple with Julio's talk this morning. Uh, top left is just global lat lawn, bottom is global lat lawn vector. And you saw this one earlier, this is the zonal mean for temperature, polar, 
and just some random ones that looked cool. Uh, this is the QBO time series up top and then the Taylor diagram on bottom. <laughs> it looks beautiful. Um, if you happen to get that multiple case that I was talking about earlier, this is the website that's gonna come out. And this is, again, I can't click on any of this, but up at the top, you'll see the different test cases in the header. Those are all linked to single case ADFs for that case versus the baseline. So it's, it's kind of like a hub for all of the cases that you want to compare together. Um, but it also has this all case comparison plot types that we've been working on. So tables, lat long, and time series. This is sort of a, kind of like a, a snippet of the website, what it looks like when you go to the, the tables. Each one of those would be links that would bring up the case A and WG table for that. Obviously there's an all case comparison. This allows you to look at all of your cases versus baseline in one place and the numbers right now in the parentheses are that case minus the baseline. These are the lat lawn plots. Um, these are all, so for however many cases you're running, each one of these plots is gonna be your test case minus baseline. So now if you have several simulations that you're running and you're checking different variables, you can sort of compare those against each other and it's flexible, it runs three, seven, I threw 15 at it just for fun. Um, it does take a while, but it does work. And lastly, just the, the time series. And again, you can call any of those plotting parameters in that one variable config file. So for like the lab C, that time series specific to those lat long extents. So now that we have sort of a foot on this new diagnostics on the ground, there's always stuff to be done, right? So um, we do have issues with the CMIP6 time series in the way that it's formatted. It's not the way the ADF likes it yet. So it has a little issue. The, the tables don't come out with CMIP6 because of that. We're working on it. Um, Efficiency is kind of a Achilles heel right now. Um, plotting is one thing. Polar plots tend to take a little bit of time, so we're looking at Dask for multiprocessing for that. Um, again, we would love to tap into more of the GeoCat package because there's a, just a, a great set of uh, resources for geospatial. Um, the model diagnostic task force is something that we'd also kind of like to do for the CBDP in atmosphere in the ADF to kind of have it running in the background as well. Um, we have a little bit of work to do on the regrading. We're, we currently use X-rays in terp like and the, the little plot there to the right kind of shows um, how well-ish it does, but NC remap tends to be kind of one-to-one and you can't really see the native line. It's blue, but it's right under pretty much NC remap. So we're hoping to kind of get that as our regrading. Um, we do have a limited set of default observation data sets that if you were to call it in that uh, config YAML file, it can only pick through these threes. But we're looking to increase that. If you have some, please send them our way. We'd love to add them to it. And you can also use your own. It, you're not defined to these three data sets. You can use your own as long as the, the pressure levels are all kind of the same. Um, and the updated website. You know, the website kind of looks like it came from the 90s when HTML was new. So uh, it's kind of an ugly duckling to a beautiful swan, I hope. <laughs> we'll see. Um, this slide is kind of the most important in my opinion for us, for me, sorry. Um, we like feedback and contributions. We're kind of a small team and we would really like to see um, just what can be enhanced. And so we do this weekly um, at hackathons every Thursday, two to four mountain time. Join us if you can, it's just a, Time and space for the ADF. You know, you can come talk about what it is if you're unfamiliar, if you're having problems installing it, if you want to fix a bug that you found, or if you want to integrate your own script into your version of the ADF or into ours, it's a, it's a great place to do that and folks who are kind of similar. Um, if you have discussions that you want to see in the ADF or maybe something's not right, we can have a discussion part in the GitHub about that. Um, obviously, if you find a bug, we can fix that, throw it up in a GitHub issue and we'll work with you to fix it or just pass it on on us if you don't wanna look at it. Just say that it's broken, we'll take care of it. And finally, we've started a community repo for ADF related code. Um, it's under the NCAR GitHub called AMP Toolbox and this is just a place for folks to put stuff that you may find useful for others 
that may not just go into the ADF because it's a little too specific, but it's a great resource and you know, maybe something good will come out of it and we can merge it into the ADF if it, if it looks that way. And finally, thanks to many folks on this list and probably some I forgot for the hard work building up to this and then letting me kind of come in and take it, break it, destroy it, and hopefully build it up. So with that, I think we have some time for some questions um, with one stipulation that I may not be able to answer all of them, but I will call out folks in the audience who can help if I bribe them with chocolate. Yeah. Sir. Uh, um, package. We're also looking for to build up some standard observational data sets, climatologies and things. I'm thinking we could coordinate there. I, I see your three. Awesome. We're looking at some MODIS products okay. that just have, and we got nice 20 year data sets from MODIS. So that sounds like something I, I you'd think love maybe, to do. Yeah. yeah. Catch me after the talk and I'll yeah. get your information. Sounds Thank you. Good. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, this all looks, looks great. My question was on the observational data set. Now I know also that a lot of the AMWG package ops data sets are probably somewhat long in the tooth. I know there's been some updates on some of the satellite products. Um, but is there any thought in kind of leveraging them just as kind of A, something that we can get in pretty quick and easily, but B, you know, for me personally, it might be as someone who's does a lot of AMWG diagnostics, it might be nice to, as like a bridge, to have an ADF-like framework that looks exactly like AMWG, oh. where I could kind of almost like, oh, this is what it looks like in ADF world, and then it's help that transition. Yeah, that would be fantastic, and I don't see why you wouldn't, wouldn't want to start there with the observation models, so absolutely. Um, if you want, we can chat more, and we can kind of set you up on how to get that in. Great, yep. thanks. One more question. I would like still to do a selection in the data set because there are some in the atmospheric working group diag that were very outdated mm -hmm. and we would need to discuss to see which data set yeah. we want to select. I assume that's the case. Yeah, yeah. Like the series data and stuff is probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have one more question in the room or online. <laughs> no. And I should, can I just supplement the on deck, I did forget to mention that we are working towards building some documentation and tutorials for the ADF as well to help folks run it more easily rather than come to us begging for help. So that's also on deck. Great. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Appreciate it. So our, our next speaker is going to be Suda Kamali, who's going to talk about um, adapting an SC Acclam into MPAS. So Suda, if you want to start sharing your screen. Sure. Um, Are you able to see my slide? Uh, yes, and you're full screen. That's great. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Suda Kamali, and I'm currently a postdoc here at NCAR, and today I'd like to share with you some of the progress that we've made in development of SC Vacuum with the non-hydrostatic MPAS-A dynamical core. And this is a joint effort with multiple labs at NCAR from HAO. I've been working with Han Lee Liu and Francis Witt from NQ with Bill Skamarok and Joe Clamp, and from CGD with Peter Lauritsen. And here's an outline for my talk today. I'll briefly talk a little bit about the background and the motivation behind this work, and then we'll go through the dynamical core configurations that were used in this uh, study, and I'll share some climatology results from the simulation. And in order to understand that climatology results, we've done some preliminary weight forcing analysis that I'll share as well, and then end with conclusions and future works. And as you might already be aware of, um, geospace uh, models require atmospheric models 
uh, with uh, tops uh, in excess of 500 kilometers uh, well into the thermosphere. Uh, for example, vacuum X extends from the Earth's surface up to approximately around 600 kilometers. And at these altitudes, the accuracy of the hydrostatic approximation becomes problematic, and there's an increasing need uh, for whole atmosphere models with non-hydrostatic dynamical cores. However, currently, the, hydro the dynamical cores that are available to vacuum X are all hydrostatic. But recently, as part of the System for Integrated Modeling of the Atmosphere, or the SEMA project, NCAR has been adapting the model for prediction across scales atmosphere, or MPAS-A, to work inside of CESM. And MPAS-A is a non-hydrostatic dynamical core and will bring non-hydrostatic modeling capabilities to CESM, which opens up the opportunity for us to run VACAMX with MPAS-A for geospace applications. But the first step towards that goal would be to first get VACAM to run with MPAS, and that's what we've been working on in the past year, and that's what I'll be presenting on in the uh, next couple of slides. And so the dynamical cores that we are mostly familiar with that work with VACAM are the FB and SE dynamical core. And as the names suggest, the FB is a finite volume solver and the SE is a spectral element solver. Uh, the FB uh, dynamical core uses a traditional lat long grid, while the SE dynamical core uses a cube sphere mesh. They're both hydrostatic dynamical cores and they both have sigma pressure vertical coordinate. Now we also have the possibility to run uh, VACAM with MPAS, which is, as I mentioned, an non-hydrostatic dynamical core. It uses a centroidal Voronoi mesh, and it's also a finite volume solver. However, it uses a secret staggering in comparison to the degree staggering used by the FV dynamical core. And in addition, MPAS has a hybrid train following high vertical coordinate. So in order for us to verify that VACAM can, in fact, work with MPAS, we decided to run VACAM with each of these dynamical cores and then compare uh, the results with each other. We used the SC VACAM for these simulations. We ran the simulations for one year on approximately 100 kilometer horizontal mesh with seven vertical levels and compared the results. Uh, we looked at mean zonal wind, climatology, and temperature, uh, and we compared them for every month. But here, for the benefit of time, I'd be only presenting results for the mean zonal wind and only for January and June. So here is the mean zonal wind climatology for the month of January from the FV, SE, and MPAS-A. And uh, both the contour lines and color are showing the mean zonal wind. And we can see that the results from the three dynamical cores are very similar. We do see some differences, but in general, the wind structure is very close. And when we compare that with the URAP climatology from January 93, we see that uh, the three dynamical cores are able to reproduce the uh, wind reversal in the MLT region, and the location of the reversal is roughly the same height for all three dynamical cores. And in order to understand this wind structure better, we also looked at some wave forcing. And I know this slide is a little busy, but bear with me as I go through it. So at the top, we have the result wave forcing for the FB, SC, and MPAS A. And at the bottom, we have the total gravity wave forcing, which is parametrized at this resolution for all of the three dynamical cores. The contour lines are still showing the mean zonal wind, but the contour color is showing the wave forcing. And we're going to see here how uh, both the result and parametrized wave forcing are driving the stratosphere wind structure and also the reversal in the MLT region. So with the result wave forcing, uh, their uh, role is very important in the stratosphere region, and especially in the uh, northern winter that we can see, the winter hemisphere. And uh, it has a really important effect in slowing down the jet in the stratosphere and mesosphere region, as we can see. And with the gravity wave parametrizations, when we look at the three dynamical core, we see a good correspondence between the gravity wave forcing and the location of the wind reversal. Uh, the three dynamical, the location of the wave forcing for the three dynamical cores is very similar at the roughly the same heights. And that's why we're seeing the wind reversal at roughly the same height for the three dynamical cores as well. So the results for the month of January for the three uh, die cores seem reasonable. And we're gonna look at the same results for June now. And so again, we have the mean zonal wind for, from the FB, SC, and MPAS-A. 
And uh, again, we're seeing that the results from the three die cores look very similar to each other. And when we compare them with the URAP climatology from June 92, we see that all three die cores are able to reproduce the wind reversal and the location of the wind reversal is roughly the same for the three dynamical cores. And again, uh, we looked at the weight forcing to try and understand this wind structure. And one thing that I wanna point out here, we, we noticed that in the Southern winter, uh, the jet is much stronger and uh, than what it was in the Northern winter that we saw in January. And this is because the stratospheric wave forcing is weaker because the result planetary waves are weaker because the land mass in the Southern hemisphere is less than the Northern hemisphere. And again, when we look at the gravity wave parametrization forcing, we see that uh, the location of the wave forcing matches well again with the wind reversal. And the location of the wave forcing is similar in the three dynamical cores. And that's why we're seeing the wind reversal at roughly the same height for the three dynamical cores as well. And another thing that we were interested in is understanding the role of gravity wave forcings in this wind structure, in particular, understanding the frontal and convective gravity wave forcing. And for that, we decided to uh, do an experiment and turn off the frontal gravity waves and do the simulations again and compare these results with when we had all gravity waves turned on to see if it gives us some insight into the role of the frontal and convective gravity wave forcing. And we've done this for the, all three die cores, but here I'm going to be only showing results from MPAS because the results were very similar. And we're gonna compare the results again from January and June. So here on the left, I have the total parameterized gravity wave forcing um, uh, for January at the top and for June at the bottom. And again, the co color contours are showing the wave forcing. And then on the right, I have the same plots, but this time from the simulations that the frontal gravity waves were turned off. And one thing that was surprising that we noticed is that in the Northern summer, even when frontal gravity waves are turned off, we see a strong wind reversal. While in the Southern summer, when uh, the gravity wave forcing is turned off, we barely see that wind reversal. And here for MPAS, we see a weak wind reversal, we, but we couldn't even see that for the SC and the FD die core. And this was interesting. And so when we looked into it a little bit more, we realized that one, thing that could be giving rise to this is that the stratosphere wind is stronger in the southern summer than in the northern summer. So that already makes the reversal of the jet harder. But then when we zoomed in also into the eastward wave forcing, we saw that the forcing is uh, larger in the northern summer in comparison to the southern summer. And we think this is this forcing is mainly coming from convective gravity waves. And the reason that we see it stronger in the Northern hemisphere is related to the larger land mass in the Northern hemisphere in comparison to the Southern hemisphere. And I wanna mention that these are very preliminary results and we think this is what's happening, but we have to really look into it more. But we thought these are interesting results to share in the working group meeting and also to hear your thoughts on this. And so, in conclusion, as part of the SEMA effort, we have developed and tested VACUM with the non-hydrostatic model for prediction across scales atmosphere or MPAS-A. We've compared the mean zonal wind and temperature climatology from the VACUM MPAS-A simulations with the results coming from VACUM using the FB and SE dynamical cores. And in general, the results look very similar for the three dynamical cores. They agree well and so, we are concluding that Wacom is running with MPAS. Uh, and in the future, we hope to further study the effects of the result and parameterize waves among the models, and also hopefully get to a point where we can perform high resolution simulations at convective scales. And I want to mention again, that this is the first step towards the main goal of adapting the non-hydrostatic MPAS A dynamical core to work with Wacom X for geospace applications. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm going to stop sharing here so that I can answer your questions. Thanks, Suda. Okay, thanks, Suda. That was great. Um, does anyone have questions? Yeah, Julio. Uh, thanks, Suda. Yeah. To me, it didn't look like all three die cores really worse. I mean, it, to me, it looks like SE is an outlier. 
there are some differences between the three die chords. You are right, but the diff the signatures of the wind structures are very similar. But I would love to hear your thoughts on when you said the SE is the outlier. Well, I mean, in both the summer, I mean, in both southern and northern winter hemispheres, uh, the stratospheric jet, the polar night jet looked really different in SE. You mean that it was stronger? It just, uh, just looked weird. <laughs> the, sh the shape the morphology is sh quite right. different, but also yeah. some of that's a there is some model bias when you get to the upper. Stream. I was gonna say also that we haven't tuned any, we haven't done any parameterization tuning here. We're just running mm -hmm. this out of the box, and so we are gonna see some differences. And I don't know if Peter Loritzen is online and he has something to add to that. He may not be online anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, Suda, I have a question. Can you give a quick rundown on the actual configurations here, like levels and things? Are they all using the same vertical scheme? They, well, they are using 70 levels, but the vertical schemes are different. For MPAS, we have a height vertical system, while for the other two, we have a, a sigma pressure vertical coordinate system. So they are a little different in that. And they're all nominal one degree? Yes, close. I mean, we can't say exactly for the SC and MPAS, but they're close to approximately 100 kilometers mesh. Okay. Yeah. Um, Suda, I have a question. Do you plan to look into the impact of orographic waves? Sorry, I, I missed that. Are you going to look into the impact of orographic gravity waves? We hope so as we move forward, but for now, we were really more interested in the frontal and convective, but as we look into it, I'm sure it would show us some insight into orographic gravity waves as well. There was a question online. Yeah, so Dan Marsh wanted to know, um, what's the relative cost of these different configurations? So MPAS and FV have basically the same cost, very close, roughly the same, and SE has a larger cost, of course, but I know that Peter Lorison told me that they are working on optimizing the SE, and so that might change to some degree. Okay, let's do one more question. Are you planning to run with the uh, higher vertical levels that we have now for the workhorse model? We actually tried it with the 110 vertical levels, and it did run. And we have done some comparisons, but it's not at a level to present it here. But yeah, we, we, we're definitely looking into that. Thanks. OK. Um, thanks, Suda. Let's move on to our next speaker, Jesse Nussbaumer. Awesome. The, can you hear? Is it too loud? Now good? Sort of, yeah, awesome. Cool. Oh, man, and it is just going. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Jesse Nussbaumer. I'm an AMP software engineer. I almost broke that. And um, I'm basically here to tell you what the other AMP software engineers, along with myself, are going to be doing essentially for the next year. Um, and that's really trying to, you've already heard multiple times, try to get us towards a step towards SEMA. 
um, by implementing the CC, something called the CCPP in CAM. And as you can tell that I've used three different acronyms in just the title slide alone, that this is gonna be a great talk. So let's uh, dive right in. Um, so yeah, you've heard about SEMA, but basically the idea is, um, you don't have to read the text, uh, but you know, the picture on the left, which I took both of these are on the SEMA website, essentially shows all various different kinds of NCAR models, so at M cubed and CGD uh, everywhere, and they all kind of tackle different spatial and temporal scales, right? CAM and WAC and MAX tackle global scales like climate time. You have MPAS, and then you could kind of down to WARF, and then eventually LES. And the idea behind SEMA is to try to build uh, a, a similar infrastructure, similar framework where you can try to run these different models um, with the same sort of software. You'd still be running MPAS, you'd still be running CAM, like the, the physics and the dynamics would be the same code. But like when you actually like open a terminal and try to run it, let's say, or um, you know try to port it, uh, that would all be the same. Uh, so you've seen this plot too. So this is the idea for SEMA v1, and uh, you know you can see again the goals. You have multiple die cores. You have the potential for multiple physics and chemistry, etc. There's sort of an open secret, which is that actually all of these are already in CAM except one. Who can guess? which one of these circles or squares is not in any form in CAM. And I'll give you a hint, the rest of the talk is about physics. And CAM physics is in CAM. So yes, thank you, Adam, it's WARF physics. So WARF physics, I don't know I did that. Uh, WARF physics is not in CAM. <laughs> um, so how would we get WARF physics into CAM, right? That's a software engineering question. So here's a terminal snapshot of CAM physics. So this is, uh, don't worry about the actual text, just notice there's a bunch of Fortran files, right? And um, this isn't all of CAM physics, but it's a decent chunk. And so you can imagine, well, why don't I just take, WARF is also in Fortran, why don't I just copy WARF and just plop it into CAM? That should work. Um, the problem though is that uh, all, of these, all of these Fortran files badly highlighted in green um, are interface files. That means they're not actually physics parameterizations. They're just source code that's designed to get a parameterization to talk to the rest of CAM. Um, so if you imagine, and that's just for CAM physics, if you imagine WARF, which has actually a lot more physics options, this would quickly spin out of control, right? Because now we'd have to have dozens of these interface code that we would have to, as SEs, you know, maintain, keep developing, update. And the problem is too, a lot of these interface codes aren't clean in the sense that they're not just doing you know, conversions from one data structure to another. A lot of times they have science kind of buried inside them. And so um, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to pull a, a parameterization out cleanly. And so if we did want to bring war physics in, how can we get past this issue of having to write a bunch of interfaces? Well, the answer is the common community physics package or the CCBP, and yes, I know, Common community have a similar root word, but ignoring that, the idea behind the CCBP is from this diagram, which I took from their website, um, which is essentially you have the atmosphere driver, which you can think of as just CAM, or, or whatever host model you have. And then you have physics parameterizations, right? They could be the CAM physics, they could be WARF, they could be UFS. And I want to highlight UFS real quick because they've already done this conversion. But um, uh, you, so you have physics schemes, and so you, all you want to do is generate an interface automatically, right? I don't want to, as a SE, write an interface, I want it to just be created. Well, that's what the CCPP does. So essentially, for every physics scheme that's CCPP compliant, it provides a metadata table that describes all of the input and output variables, which I'll go through later. But essentially, it gives me a description of things like you know units and data type and uh, the standard name, which is probably the most important attribute. And then you provide the same thing for CAM, metadata table provided uh, up there, that top bluish box, and then the CCP, CCPP framework uh, will take that knowledge and generate the interfaces, which in CCPP world is called a cap, but it'll automatically generate those caps for you. So that means I could, if both CAM was ready for the CCPP and say WARF or UFS or whatever was CCPP compliant, I literally could just plop the WARF physics into CAM and the CCPP would automatically make sure they're connected properly. So how does that work and how does that, like, what does that look like? So the top level of the CCPP is something called a suite definition file, which is an XML file which simply describes 
what are all of the physics schemes or parameterizations you're going to run during this model simulation. And so this is an actual example. This is when we converted um, the held Suarez like simple physics into CCTP. And it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Held Suarez is not the most complicated, so the scheme is called Held Suarez. Uh, and then essentially applying the tendencies from Held Suarez to the model state. And then QNEG is something to make sure you don't have negative tracer mass. Uh, but the real advantage of this is that if you can imagine if I had this for all of TAM, you would have a scheme that said, you know, Zhang McFarlane, and then a scheme that said club, and a scheme that said RRTMGP or something. If I just wanted to rearrange the order of those physics, I literally just have to change the order of these schemes. I don't have to modify any Fortran code. I don't have to modify any source code. The CCBP would automatically manage all of that for us. And that's a big deal. Uh, Julio talked about the physics reorder, um, which Adam Harrington and others briefly took on, but it took us months because you can rearrange the Fortran calls, then you found out like, whoops, this call depends on that call. And so now you've broken everything and you have to spend a long time fixing it. That's not a problem with the CCPP. Um, okay, so great. So you have this file, but then what does an actual scheme look like? So a scheme potentially takes up two parts, the, the physics parameterization source code, and then the metadata file. And we'll focus on the source code, which is here. And the, the one requirement right now at CCPP is it has to be written in Fortran. That's probably not a huge burden because most of our stuff is written in Fortran. And we are working, the CCPP, my understanding is there's possible plans to also allow for like C and C++. But for now, it's Fortran. Um, and one of the nice things about it is we notice this is an actual scheme. This is the simple one. It's just applying a tendency to a state. But that's actually relatively clean Fortran, right? There's no use case. There's no use statements in here. There's no pbuf in here. It's literally just give me the inputs and then do your math and then just return. And the CCPP will then actually make sure that that call, that subroutine is connected properly. And so the way it does that is with the metadata table, which is over here. And again, you can see like in the subroutine, right, there's NZ, DU, DT, U, et cetera. They're all listed here. And then this is where you provide the metadata, the standard name, the unit, the type. Um, and the real key one is the standard name because that's what the CCPP uses to say, okay, you have some output that's X wind, um, or let's say zonal wind. So if I want to give this back to the model, I just need to make sure that the model has some other variable also called zonal wind. The other one advantage of that is that actually in the actual code, they don't have to be called the same. In the model, it could be state percent U, and in the parameterization you have, it could be winding, and it wouldn't matter as long as they both have the same standard name. Um, the other thing too is it forces you to give a physical description to your variable. I'm, Suspicious that when we go through and convert all of CAM's physics, we will find that parameterizations thought they were using a quantity with dry air or moist air, and in fact, it was the opposite. Um, and so this kind of forces you to explicitly describe what the variables are doing, or so excuse me, what they are physically. Um, just real quick, and then in CCPP world, you split your um, physics parameterization into five different phases. Essentially, it's just the beginning of the model, beginning of the time step, uh, the middle of the time step where you're actually running the physics, then end of time step and end of model. But that's just for, for fun fact, and that's probably not relevant. Anyways, uh, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to actually take all of that CAM physics, that whole terminal list of Fortran files, and convert them into the CCPP? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to save what's known as a snapshot of the model state before and after every physics scheme, every physics parameterization. And we already have the code to do this. So it's just literally a call, basically call snapshot, and uh, it'll save every, um, basically every quantity that CAM has. So everything in the state, intend, in the pbuf, the physics buffer, um, in CAM in and CAM out. Basically everything we can grab, we save. Then we will create that metadata file, and we'll also convert the Fortran source code to be CCP compliant, which is splitting up into the phases removing pbuff, et cetera. Then we will at least add that run phase, that's the part that's like actually doing the parameterization physics, uh, back into CAM and then make sure that it's bit for bit. So that basically said we didn't, we haven't broken the actual parameterization. Then we would take this full CCP key, not just the run scheme, and add it to CAM, which I'll describe in the next slide. 
And then we'll test the full scheme in Camden by reading in that beginning, that snapshot before the scheme, and then the snapshot after the scheme to make sure, again, everything is bit for bit. We haven't changed answers. So real quick, what's Camden? So Camden is basically new Cam. Uh, essentially, it's intent by us software engineers to completely rewrite the model infrastructure of Cam. And that's for two reasons. One is to try to meet SEMA goals from a general software standpoint. And the other is to just kind of get under what is literally decades of technical debt. Um, and so trying to use more modern software practices. And don't, don't worry about that. I'm just trying to show you that we're doing things. You don't actually read that. Uh, but, but I promise we're doing things. And, um, and the hope is that this is, um, we're hoping to make this repo public probably by the summer. We're just kind of waiting. We want to at least be, have it so people can run one kind of F, simple model F comp set and have history and everything. So, but once that's done, we'll make it public. And so if you want to check it out, you know, we're definitely more than happy for you to do so. Okay, so finally, um, people in time, this is what it's going to take. So uh, besides myself, we obviously have most of the other CAM uh, software engineers. I think you probably should have Cheryl and John. Um, Courtney Peverly is our, our newest SE. You may or may not have met her. Um, I really want to highlight her because she'll be soon to be, it says AMPs, but probably all the way up to NCAR. She'll basically be NCAR's CCPP framework expert, or at least CGD. So that means in the future, if you have a question, you can go to her and you can leave me alone and that everything will be as it should. Beyond that, um, Kate Thayer Caller, you might know, she at one point made a statement in a meeting. She did CCPI's thing, so now she's on here. Um, Peter Loritzen, who's a scientist, but he attends the SE meeting, so he's also guilty. And then, and then the rest of the AMP scientists who we'll have to go to to make sure that we have the right metadata. You know, we, the variable we think it is is what we think it is. Um, and then finally, the hope is... Uh, this, this hope should have a strong asterisk. This is like paleoclimate time error bars on this thing. But uh, the uh, hope is that we will have CAM 7s physics, so CAM devs, mostly CCPPIs, by this time next year. So that's the hope. Uh, but it depends on a, a lot, uh, which you can ask me if you want. Uh, all right, I think that's it. All right, thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? If it why. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Welcome to the team. Then uh, <laughs> when you have the cam snapshot, yep. when you are saving the state, you are saving everything to make sure that you don't screw up yep. anything when you do a change. But it will be only in a certain configuration. Then for example, if you have a flag then oh. it, yeah, you see yeah, what you I mean? Like then it's just like you can still break something that's in another yeah, there's optional inputs. It? Yeah, it would be. You're right. It'd be for certain. It'd only be for a certain set of optional inputs to that parameterization. Okay. Then, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you have still to be very careful to see all the combina the million of combinations. And I asked yeah. Courtney, and then. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, the goal is whatever. In some ways, that'll depend. We'll do it first to make sure we haven't like broken the force ramp. But at some point, whenever we land on CAM, whatever CAM 7 should be, whatever that configuration is, I imagine then we'll remake the snapshots and make sure that that configuration works. So at least at least the default workhorse version is tested. Uh, and we know that, that works. Um, if there's a flag that's really popular, we can, in some ways the barrier to make those snapshots is pretty low. Like we only run the model for several time steps basically. So it wouldn't be that hard to, if there was a request for like, hey, check this configuration. We but, yeah. yeah. Is there time for one? Well, sure. Yeah. Else? Oh, but there were other. Like, oh, no, 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 go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm just wondering when you showed your example of the suite. Yep. It, it, a lot of it was kind of common things to different parameterizations, like the yeah. tendency of X. And I'm wondering, are you going to have to write that for every scheme, or you can just okay. presume that? Uh, no, the hope, and eventually, which Courtney is working on, is we will have a sort of. Um, basically, we'll have a way for a suite to call another suite, and so you can imagine then um, it would just say scheme like update state, and then okay. and then it would automatically give you all the applied like the group update. Maybe one more. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, so I was going to say, I think that sort of answered my question. I was going to say, have we thought about um, capabilities for process and sequential splitting of physics, which I think kind of ties into that, but then the other one would be subcycling. So some well, parameter. Both of, them, both of them are already actually in the CCPP. I mean, I don't have it here, but you would have something, the, the time split process split, you can already kind of specify that with a different XML flag. I think the same for subcycling. You would just have like subcycle and then some amount you would subcycle right. and then. But that's the CCPP, like almost like the driver level. Like it's not something that would have to get baked in in those run scripts or anything. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. It would be at the it would be at the this XML file level. And so yeah, the idea is you would. Um, I think right now you still have to do it at build time, but we can see. But yeah, essentially, right when you build, you'd have your S, your sweet file, and you would just change that, and then that would be what it would run with. How many sweets you expecting? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we expect. At least three, because we need CAM seven, and we need, uh, and there's plans for CAM, I'm not sure for CAM seven, but at least then also CAM five and CAM four, so it's been requested. Um, at some point, there also have to be, there'll be more than that, because there'll also be suites for simple physics, so there's Held Suarez here, and there's Kessler and Gray Radiation, or others I can think of. Um, after that, the question then becomes, are people going to want to run like UFS physics inside CAM, in which case you would need a UFS suite. Um, although, no would probably be providing that, so it would just be copying from their repo. Uh, and an unbounded interfaces in, in particular suites. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that could be uh, large. Um, I don't, I can point you to a file that's an approximation for CAM 6, but it can be, if you fully expand it out, I mean, it's like 50 or 60. So um, it can be really big. Chemistry, can we, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to name names, but yeah, I can say it can be really big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to our final speaker, Mark Morris. Let me turn Kind of? Yeah? Does it work? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Whew, that's loud. Okay. Um, so I'm Monica Einhorn Morrison. I'm currently a postdoc in the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory. Um, I'm a philosopher of science, so we're going to be uh, shifting gears here or, well, even dismounting the bike we're on and getting on a new one, if you will. Um, and I know we're running a little behind time, so I'm going to try and go as quickly as possible. Um, I will note that I'm kind of just laying these ideas out here um, in the atmospheric uh, chemistry, whole atmosphere working group context, but um, what I'm going to say I think is applicable to all of the working groups and CSM community in general. Um, and basically, this is the argument that I'm going to make today, is that as we have increased attention um, within the CESM community towards things like climate justice and wanting to put our uh, model towards actionable purposes. Um, I think that there's a lot of upstream things that we need to be doing. Um, and one of the upstream things that we need to be doing is what's known as epistemic risk and hazard management. Um, and that I will explain in a minute. Um, epistemic risk just generally refers to um, the possibility when we're making decisions of getting things wrong. Um, in scientific inquiry, um, and this can happen in the modeling context because our models are built to be adequate for certain purposes, which doesn't necessarily entail that they're adequate for other purposes that weren't in mind when they were constructed and assessed. Um, and if we are not explicit about documenting the adequacy for purpose of our models, um, and we don't engage in a lot of transparency and intentional communication about that, um, as we move into the actionable realm, as we have um, greater concerns for wanting to move towards uh, more just practices, um, we can actually cause more harm. Um, and so there's ethical considerations that come up in our modeling practices as we start to um, kind of contemplate these, I guess, additional aims um, within our practices. Um, so quickly, epistemic risk. Um, scientific inquiry involves making a series of decisions. Um, these decisions, anytime you make them, um, carry the risk of your making a mistake. 
um, making a mistake that in the end could lead you to endorse, for example, a false conclusion um, or reject a true hypothesis, okay? Um, and these decisions aren't just about how to go about weighing your evidence um, when it might be underdetermined or something like that, but also we have decisions about what assumptions we want to involve, what conceptual frameworks we want to um, endorse, what approaches we want to use in terms of methodological approaches, um, what frameworks we want to use to evaluate our results, how we want to do uncertainty quantification, stuff like that. All those decisions involve risk. Um, and not only the risk um, of getting things wrong in the end, um, but also the risk that that decision that we're making is inadequate for the purposes towards which our scientific practices are actually oriented. And that is the type of epistemic risk that I think is of most concern when we're thinking about modeling practices, whether that be model development, the implementation of different physics schemes, the way we go about configuring our model, how we do our experimental or simulation designs, um, the way that we choose to design and then apply metrics for evaluating impacts. Um, all of these decisions carry with them um, a certain degree of risk, um, where if that risk um, is actually kind of realized, if you will, introduces a hazard that can lead to downstream harms. Um, and so just to kind of give this a little bit more context, um, models, scientific models um, in general, and Earth system models even, um, are adequate for purpose and built to be such. And so we make a series of representational decisions in the course of um, developing something that describes our system of interest. And these, especially when we're dealing with a complex system, are not simply decisions about what to represent, but also how we ought to go about representing certain things relative to that purpose. So we're making decisions about how much simplification we can have for certain things, how much idealization um, we can accept, what we can obscure and how much we can obscure it, and also if we can omit certain things. Um, and all these are relative to our purposes. Um, and so, specifically when it comes to model development, the risk there is that these decisions about what to represent in the target system and how to represent things about the target system are, the risk they carry is that they're going to be inadequate for giving us the type of information we want when we're applying our model, that they're going to be inadequate for our purposes. And the hazard that can be introduced can result in a downstream harm. The hazard itself being that the decision we make is in itself inadequate. Um, and the downstream harms can be that when we apply the model or use the model to answer our questions, we can get highly inaccurate results, we can get misleading results, we can get irrelevant results, or we can even get distracting information. Um, and so this is where I think Earth system models um, have the most trouble is that um, these models are designed with certain purposes in mind. Um, can argue about what those purposes might be. I think they actually differ across different modeling endeavors. So the purposes uh, which CSM is directed towards are slightly different than the purposes that maybe GFDL models are oriented towards or E3SM is oriented towards. Although there are also these overarching purposes like participation in CMIP, um, having a state of the art model. Um, but the way those are interpreted and what those mean for community decisions differ. But outside of those purposes, when we make simulations available, model configurations, we don't say what they're actually adequate for. When we provide output data from our simulations and we don't say what those simulations were purposed for and what that data can adequately be used for, um, then we engage in a lot of risk, right? And there's a lot of hazards there that need to be managed in order for our practices to be considered um, ethical. And that becomes increasingly salient as we move into an actionable um, science direction where these model applications, this data, these simulations, right, that are possibly subject to misuse, misinterpretation, misunderstanding, could actually be used to inform decisions that people are making about how to adapt whether climate interventions are feasible and safe and effective in the way they need to be. Um, and so um, basically I think, um, <laughs> and this is probably my pitch line, um, is that we actually have moral epistemic duties to identify, manage, and more fully assess epistemic risk in our modeling, be transparent 
about when hazards might actually arise if people are repurposing the model for something that's not been adequately assessed for or was not one of the things that was considered during its development. Um, because we can do harm if we don't do that. Um, if we're going around telling people that these simulations that are really meant to allow us to investigate model land um, can be used to assess impacts and then draw, um, infer things about the real world and then people are, are using those to inform decisions, there can be great economic loss, there can be mal-intervention, mal-adaptation, a bunch of other things. Um, so just why this is a concern for actionable science is because one of the features of an actionable science product is that it is useful, which means that there is logical consistency between the research question that one is asking as well as the information that is being used to provide evidence towards an answer, um, but there's also adequacy. There's historical empirical adequacy, right, that our instruments and our information need to have. There's also representational adequacy, which is the one that I think is the one that really needs to be managed because there's a lot of risk associated with that. Conceptual adequacy, value adequacy, which means that our acceptance of type one or type two errors really should be consistent with user purposes um, and as opposed to developer purposes and, and their value judgments um, and um, pra pragmatic uh, adequacy. Um, so that actually has to do with kind of how we have multiple configurations um, so that people who have less access to um, supercomputers and computing resources, right, they have a model that's actually adequate for their purposes. Um, so that would be a pragmatic adequacy for purpose thing. Um, and so adequacy for purpose, representational adequacy for purpose, is super important for, for our instruments if our instruments are going to be used at any point in the process of generating actionable information or actionable products. So these are my criteria for representational adequacy. So representational adequacy or physical adequacy just means that the model actually contains or describes that feature of the physical system that's necessary in order for you to capture the phenomena of interest in a reliable manner during your simulations and that the behavior is reliable. Um, so a great example of how models used to not have certain um, representational adequacy for the Great Lakes is that a lot of models didn't even have lakes, some of them only had one-dimensional lakes, very few had three-dimensional lakes, where three-dimensional lakes are kind of what is minimally adequate for being able to actually um, capture the lake atmosphere interactions that determine a lot of the precipitation regimes um, over the Great Lakes region, and yet people were using the CMIP models and their output to understand what possible impacts to the Great Lakes region might be under future climate change. Despite that, glaring representational deficiency. One of the reasons it was overlooked is because nobody really documented it. You had to go through all of the land model documentation material for all of the CMIP models to figure out how they treated lakes. It took the people who did it at GLISA, the Great Lakes um, Integrated Science and Assessment Center, five years um, to look at the documentation for 36 CMIP models to figure out what rape, uh, lake representation actually looks like. Um, which is pretty crazy. Um, we also have process and dynamical adequacy. Does it simulate the processes in a physically plausible way? And then the emergent properties of those processes interacting, which would be the dynamics of the system. And then you also have to think about configuration adequacy. Um, and you have to think about experimental setup adequacy, as well as data adequacy, because data right, as a result of a series of simulations is purpose for a certain thing um, and can be used for unintended purposes that can introduce hazards and lead to harms. Um, and so, right, this is kind of just the argument as to why you wanna do actionable science, then you have certain moral epistemic duties um, to uh, be better at communicating um, and systematically documenting adequacy for purpose of our models during development and application. Um, and this is the very least kind of thing that I think we can do um, is to actually communicate better, to have kind of standardized documentation practices um, during model development, during model application. Um, when we put things out there like regionally refined simulations in their data packages to tell people what they're actually adequate for and why we did those experiments so that people at least have the knowledge necessary to be able to make a judgment as to whether or not if they decide to use that, there might be an introduction of a hazard because that decision to use it involves risk 
and they should be allowed to be informed about the possibility of that risk in the introduction of hazards so they can avoid harms downstream if that's something they would like to do, which hopefully they would. And then as we get more and more into the realm of talking about justice, um, there's this thing in philosophy called epistemic justice or epistemic injustice. Um, and epistemic injustices basically occur when there's harm or wrong to an individual in terms of their capacity as like a knower, okay? Somebody who can have knowledge and apply it. Um, and an individual or group that's already experiencing one form of injustice, for example, like institutional injustices, social economic injustices, environmental injustices, um, can be further disadvantaged, especially epistemically with respect to their ability to have knowledge and use that knowledge um, in a way that benefits them um, when certain information is um, obscured or omitted that they might need in order to make good decisions um, or decisions that put them on an epistemically equitable playing field with other people who have access to that information. Um, and so here I see that there's an intersection of climate and epistemic injustice. Basically, throughout the history of model development, there are certain groups that have been largely marginalized in that scientific endeavor, and so their knowledges to begin with are not actually represented um, in our decisions about what we want to represent, how we want to represent things, what constitutes a model that has skill. Um, and if we go about kind of just applying our models, handing over information without also contextualizing it in the proper way by saying it's adequate for these purposes because this is how we applied the model, this is what these simulations were meant to actually investigate, um, then I think we actually compound the injustice that they're already experiencing um, by putting them at a greater disadvantage because now they might have certain hazards in the information that they have that can lead them to um, have amplified harms in terms of maladaptation in a context where they're already experiencing socio socioeconomic um, climate and environmental injustices. Um, so it's really important if we actually want to be just um, to think about what epistemic justice requires of us as a community in terms of transparency surrounding our practices and systematic and intentional communication about what our modeling studies and our models are actually adequate for so that people aren't making inferences from CMIP data about certain impacts in their region when the models have not been well vetted to be determined to have representational adequacy that allows them to provide answers to those questions. Um, again, at the very least, right, I wanted to put the low hanging fruit up there um, because the, I guess, a higher fruit um, is something that's a little bit harder, but I think that that if we're doing something like these refined, um, the, these regional refined simulations, right, and this is something we want to share with the community, that that gives an opportunity to kind of almost do a proof of concept, right, of what would these kind of systematic documentation practices look like so that we can provide this information to the community and they're informed about what the models can be adequately used for um, and their data can be adequately used for versus not. Um, and what type of information they would need. Um, it could look something like or be coupled with something like the expert opinion um, that has been supplied for the appropriate uses of climate data in the climate data guide that um, Dave Schneider um, has uh, put forward. There's also a precedent for this in that Clara Desser's group, when they did the large ensemble, um, put out a guidance document for um, how to actually use the output from the simulations um, in, in, I'll just say adequate again, but uh, adequate manner um, so that you don't run the risk of misinterpreting or misusing um, the information. Um, but I think that this needs to be something um, that our practices shift towards and needs to be systematic um, and intentional. Um, and that's kind of the boundary management that I suggest um, is greater transparency, as I said, in, in, intentional and systematic communication. Um, but if you want to set the bar a little bit higher, um, we could engage in collaborative efforts. And my suggestion there would be actually having something like an advisory council 
um, as part of the CSM working group structures, especially when it comes to climate justice, so that those uh, standpoints, epistemic standpoints and perspectives that have been historically marginalized in model development um, can actually be included in decision making about what future model development should look like, what the model should actually prioritize in terms of development for various applications that might have gotten <laughs> overlooked because of um, just systematic injustices in Western science institutions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Model development, but if there's any specific questions for Monica, we have time for them now. There's one on my end. There's a few. Let me start with Julio. Well, I guess, what, what do you suggest people do? Because I, I would think that a lot of the modelers whose models in CMIP were used to do Great Lakes studies would be the first ones to say, well, you can't use this for that. But that information is not ever put out there, right? So we have a tendency to make the models, simulations, the data available, but not provide caveats. And I mean, there's this, I think that there's this, um, there's this idea that, well, there's model documentation. So if you really want to know, you can go and find it. But most people who are users of models or model data are not going to mine that information to find the one thing that they need. Um, especially considering that a lot of those publications are like 50, 60 page publications that are in the kind of non-popular interdisciplinary journals like climatic change and stuff. Um, I mean, I, you know, I studied model development practices um, for my doctoral thesis and with respect to three models for um, CMIT 5, it took me three years to understand the differences between the models what they could be good at versus not good at, things like that. Um, and, and so, I mean, there's, there's ways that we can do better to provide this information as a community so that um, we can manage the possible hazards as the models are being increasingly used to tell us about things like adaptation, resilience, and intervention. Can I actually have a follow-up there? Because I think the issue is, you're saying, would someone tell them, don't use this to study the Great Lakes? Like, how many specific things do you have to go down on a list to say what to do or not? Okay. I was going to say, I'm imagining you're suggesting the idea is to, to communicate, you know, the model grid is 100 kilometers. It is not appropriate to look at these type of regional things, and that's going to capture lakes, everything else. I don't know, but I'm imagining that's the suggestion here. Not, that's a starting point for okay. sure. Not a specific list, but like a Well, very no, because you can't exhaustively determine what all the possible purposes yeah. are going to be that the model might be applied for. But you can provide some kind of guidance, and that can be built off of, right? And it'll become more comprehensive as time goes on. Um, but I mean, there's certain starting points. Like, we have knowledge of certain gaps, right? We have knowledge that certain of the simulations, certain of the MIPS, right, are actually used to um, test hypotheses about the models themselves, and so inferences ought not be made about the real world from that data. We don't even, like, we don't even tell people that. So people are just downloading, like, data from the various MIPS and then drawing conclusions about the real world and possibly using that to inform decisions about adaptation, intervention, resilience, and that's very dangerous. <laughs> Just maybe a short note, though, it has to be from the other side, too, because it is also the responsibility for the people that do those studies. Oh, yes, because absolutely. Because, you know, if you put out a process study, you know it's a process study, it's all written over there, it's a process study, but people take it as an impact study. It's not, what can you do, right? Well, so you can be clear it, about what it's adequate you can, for. But you cannot often prevent. I mean, I can give you some examples for the climate intervention, solar dimming globally with models that don't have aerosols. Completely unrealistic, but showing big scale features for processes. People take it and say, this changes the Saharan rainfall by that percent. Are there caveats or are there documentation of what those studies are adequate for to at least inform it's people that they ought not be it used for process. that? Yeah, it is this process. But people aren't going to see that's like you have to put it in more ordinary language terms because a lot of times that we express these things 
in ways that don't make it across the boundary and can't be interpreted across the boundary between developers, right, people that study the inner workings of models and the mechanisms, right, that make them go, that construct parameterizations, and users who are interested um, in just using the models to gain insight into the real world, right? There's translation issues here, which is why one of the things I said we need to do better is actually translate about adequacy for purpose, in addition to being explicit about it. Um, let me go online to Leo Donner, who's got a question. Leo, you can on mute. Yes, uh, thank you, Monica. Um, I'm very much reacting to your talk in the context of Erica Thompson's book, Escape from Model Land, oh, yes. uh, which I'm using as I lecture in our ethics course for our graduate students this semester. The question I wanted to ask, though, was how to bring some of what you're talking about into the assessment process. So things like IPCC, the National Climate Assessment, um, how are they doing with respect to this? And is there a, a better way for them to take into account some of the things you've talked about? Um, so I think that they did a little bit better um, with AR6, um, although there's still work to be done. Um, for example, you might have seen that they gestured towards the fact that um, values can influence modeling decisions and the way that model decision, uh, model information is interpreted. So they're actually taking into account some of these like social dimensions of modeling practice and stuff. Um, but I think one of the problems is that that inadequacy for purpose um, oftentimes I think is seen as just something that concerns uncertainties within the model. And so there's this odd kind of like assumptive synonymy there. Um, so it's the idea that, that we can engage in a certainty quantification and deal with the inadequacies of the model um, for certain purposes by expressing uncertainties associated um, with, with certain modeling behaviors and stuff. Um, but I think that, that there's qualitative things that need to be communicated in addition to communicating about uncertainties and it's still not clear to me how to do that. I know they do some of it in, in, in socio-ecological modeling, so there's some precursors that could possibly be, be adopted, but I just think in general we need to do a much better job. <laughs> and that book's amazing. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, she, she does a really good job of, of providing background for, for why we need to watch out about how our models are used. Okay. Thanks so much, Monica. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Rich. You know, I worry about culpability in this framework, such that you could imagine uh, you could come to a certain person, let's call him Brian, and you ask, um, is this appropriate for this um, study? And Absolutely, could, yes. yes. And he could say yes or no. <laughs> yeah, like me. Or, 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 you know, yes or no. He could say yes, and he's, he, he, did, he knows it's not appropriate. So you do the study, and it comes out with the answer that could impact based on your mitigation kind of... Um, uh, approach uh, or actions. We could also say, yes, it's appropriate, but it could still turn out to be bad in terms of, and then does that make him culpable because he said yeah. he was, okay, I mean, that's what I worry about because as soon as we make an assessment of whether a model is appropriate, then we're on the hook for it. I don't think you're on the hook for that being a, like, flawed expert judgment because we have to understand that even within the context of expert judgment there's possibility there's fallibility right um and so i don't think that you're culpable for um those types of consequences i see of this more as being that there's a certain duty um the duty is to provide that information um and so the culpability is associated with whether or not you satisfy the duty as opposed to what the possible consequences of satisfying that duty might be. Um, so the lens with respect to responsibility for error is on whether or not you actually do the thing that you should do, which is to provide the information as opposed to what the consequences of providing that information might have been intended or unintended. So it's what's known as a deontological as opposed to a consequentialist perspective. Um, and ethics, yeah. So, anyways, sorry. We had maybe another question before. Was there a question over the? Okay, so we'll take that. I was gonna say. Um, you can also just like email me yeah. if you want to have a philosophical discussion. I'll be here all week. Um, uh, we can have a philosophical discussion over beer tomorrow. Um, that might be a little bit gentler. Um, 
But yeah, I don't want to take all this time away from just a more general discussion about future directions of the, the working group. Co-chairs, so. for one second, I want to know what we need to cover the rest because we're very low on time. Right, um, and we, we have to be out of this room. You know, everything has to be out of this room by five or we all turn into pumpkins or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we have to pay a lot of money. That's even worse. Yeah. Your in-person registration will not be... <laughs> um, maybe for now, can we table questions on this? This was a really great discussion. Thanks for your presentation. It was awesome. And let's, for now, thank all the speakers today. Uh, <laughs> things to think about and carry on for the rest of the meeting. Um, yeah, this is like a starting point. It's definitely subject to a lot of improvement, discussion, things like that. I just want to throw the ideas out there. Um, to give a slightly different perspective on some of the things that are being discussed in CSM community. So, a couple announcements. I don't know, do you want to... Okay, so Elizabeth just noted that a link for tomorrow's sessions will be sent, um, but also, for those who are here in person, links for payment if you are here in person and drinking coffee. So please make sure you do that. $45 for drinking coffee. Yes. <laughs> please, there is an honor system. Um, and then tomorrow we are starting parallel sessions. AMWG in the morning is going to be in the Damon room. CCWG is in the, um, let me get this right, the Chapman room. So Damon room upstairs in that corner of the building, Chapman room over there. You see signs for it. Um, and then we're going to come back here. Um, in the afternoon, if you want to join for the rest of the AMWG. Uh, we'll session. also have the seminar, the CGD seminar right. at 11. The CGD seminar is in, also in at 11, room. Yeah. which is part of the sort of AMWG. Right. Yeah. Am I missing any announcements? When do we need to read, when do we need to know that we want to go to Under the Sun? Uh, Elizabeth said if, if she had an idea by Lunchtime tomorrow, okay. that would be, would be okay. Okay, so remember that link is on the right. register or on the main page for the meeting. Right. Okay, thank you everyone. It's 4.30. This is great. We get to adjourn. See you all tomorrow morning. All right.